I think we can have the It's that. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the sixth session of the WTO's Virtual Agricultural Symposium of 2020 on agricultural trade and food system transformation organized on the occasion of the 25th year's anniversary. I am Cédric Penn, Councillor in the WTO Agricultural and Commodities Division, and I will be moderating this panel. Our session this afternoon will look at agricultural trade in 2050 towards forward-looking disciplines. As we have heard in the previous sessions, international trade in food and agriculture is critical in addressing some of the main challenges facing the world today, such as food security, environmental sustainability and climate change, nutritional diversity and food safety. The second session also demonstrated how the COVID-19 crisis underscored the value of international trade for global food security and the critical importance of adopting concrete actions to keep international trade in food flowing and protect the global food supply chain from disruption. To sum up, the discussions thus far have shown that more open, predictable, transparent, fair and less distorted international trade in food and ag products is an integral part of the solutions to the challenge ahead. In this regard, as the guardian of the rules-based multilateral trading system, the WTO provides the framework in terms of governance and rules agreed by all members for international trade to play its role as efficiently as possible. But exactly 25 years have elapsed since the creation of the WTO and the entry into force of the WTO Agreement on Agriculture. And 20 years have passed since the creation of the Committee in Agriculture in Special Session to oversee the negotiations of new disciplines on agriculture. Thus, the current WTO disciplines on agriculture negotiated 30 years ago are still in place, with the noticeable exception of export competition following the December 2015 Nairobi decision. 
In other words, if we are to follow the same pace, new disciplines agreed today would still be in place in 2050. And yet, while negotiations seem to take more and more time, the world seems to change faster and faster. The purpose of our session today is not to focus on the tribulation of the ongoing agricultural negotiation. This will be the preoccupation of the Committee on Agriculture in Special Session next week. The purpose today is to solicit the mid-term vision of well-recognized trade experts to pursue the discussions on possible avenues to reform ag trade policy and approaches for the design of forward-looking multilateral disciplines required to achieve the agricultural trade and food system transformation which is the purpose of this symposium, the topic of this symposium. So I'm therefore happy and honored to welcome a great group of very knowledgeable speakers whom I would like to introduce without further ado. Carmel Cahill, former Deputy Director, Trade and Agricultural Directorate in the OECD. Sophia Murphy, Executive Director, Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. Janvier Nkurinziza, Chief of the Commodity Research and Analysis Section at UNCTAD, Gerda Van Dijk, former Director, International Trade at Department of Agriculture and South Africa's Agricultural Councillor to the WTO, former South Africa Agricultural Councillor to the WTO. And finally, Darcy Vetter, former Chief Ag Negotiator in the Office of the USTR. Before we engage in our discussion, let, rem let me remind all of our viewers that you can ask questions if you are registered for this event on the WTO webpage. My first question is going to be for you, Janvier. Could you help us set the scene with a quick overview of the main trends over the past decades and your projections regarding international agricultural markets and prices in the next years? including the main factors of uncertainty in this regard. And I understand you have a couple of slides you would like to share with us in this regard. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Cedric. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, inviting Angta to speak at uh, this event. So let me first uh, share a couple of slides. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that, uh, uh, let me, yeah. Uh, I would like to say that uh, forecasting commodity markets is a very, very tricky <laughs> exercise. But uh, I think history, uh, we can glean some lessons uh, from history. So let me show you a couple of slides where we can probably learn uh, something about the evolution of uh, uh, agriculture prices. Uh, so we have um, uh, this slide, which shows the trend uh, in uh, uh, commodity prices. Uh, I have all commodities, not just agriculture. So food and non-food are the red and uh, uh, green, uh, green colors. So the story here really, this covers more than a century uh, of data. So the story is these prices have been trending downwards in the long term. Of course, there are uh, uh, periods of uh, some price increases, but these periods tend to, tend to be very uh, relatively short. So basically relative to the short term, to the long term, prices uh, have followed uh, uh, a declining trend. And I don't see any uh, reason why uh, this uh, uh, would change uh, in the uh, near future. So what is the meaning of this? The meaning of this is really, just to be concrete now, is like if I take two commodities, for example, uh, cocoa and coffee, it means that you see it's the same trend. I mean, this is from 1960 to 2019. We see for uh, Arabica coffee, Robusta coffee and cocoa, this has very many implications. The implications uh, are that one, uh, governments uh, that are hi highly reliant on the exports of these commodities, get less uh, revenues from their export, so they can spend less, uh, they can invest less. And uh, there is also an effect on uh, households, for example, that produce coffee and uh, cocoa. Their incomes just uh, 
uh, go down when the international prices go down. And by the way, uh, these households uh, just earn a very small fraction of, uh, of the price that, uh, that you see here. So basically over time, we expect that uh, these prices will not uh, increase uh, remarkably. And uh, we have run a simulation uh, a couple of years ago, which shows that by 2000, 2030, uh, the primary food uh, products, the prices will remain almost flat. They will have increased by 1.4% only between 2010 and uh, 2030. But uh, processed uh, foods uh, will increase by 10.6%. Uh, so we see that prices are not going to, to increase uh, um, uh, very much. But of course, there are regional differences. In Africa, for example, according to the simulation, uh, the prices will decline due to productivity increases and probably land, uh, land expansion. But in South Asia, the prices will, uh, will increase. Uh, by about 18.5% uh, prices of, uh, 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 of food, uh, food, food products. Now, what are the major effects, uh, major factors that are going to, uh, to, influence, uh, to influence this or major risks uh, or uncertainties as you put it in your question? Uh, one is really the future of oil. Uh, we know that oil is a major input in uh, many uh, the production of uh, 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 many uh, agriculture uh, food products. Of course, there is a population growth uh, uh, and also income growth because in countries where you have, uh, especially in developing countries, as incomes grow, people tend to move out of agriculture food products into more processed uh, products, uh, food products and non-agriculture non -agriculture products. And of course, there's climate change. Uh, I don't need to say much about this because we know how this uh, uh, is already affecting agriculture even now. Now, these are uncertainties, but there are also the technological uncertainties. We don't know exactly how technology is going to change. We know there are already new technologies here. For example, the so-called smart uh, agriculture, which tries to, uh, to address some of uh, the problems uh, that are brought about by uh, climate change. So basically, to sum up, to sum up, we see a trend where prices have historically been uh, trending downwards. We don't have any reason to think that there will be a serious reversal in this trend. And uh, we think that there are some key factors that are going to, to influence uh, the future of uh, agriculture, uh, commodities, and I have just uh, named a few. So let me stop here for now. Thanks, thanks a lot, Janvier, for this uh, initial uh, uh, presentation. I think it's you, you. You make, of course, a very good point that you cannot look at food and agricultural prices and products uh, in isolation from other factors, including energy price and economic growth, obviously. Uh, Carmel, you, you, you were involved in the preparation in 2011, as uh, some other people, uh, in uh, the report by a group of international organizations on food price volatility in the G20 context, uh, following episodes of food price spikes. Uh, would you, what are your views on, on current agricultural put trade policies nowadays in light of the recommendations made at that time in, in this report? Uh, thank you, uh, Cedric. It's a great pleasure to be here, even if it would be nicer to be actually there. <laughs> um, but anyway, thank you for the, the invitation. Um, that moment back then in, in 2011, I think, was quite remarkable. Uh, it was remarkable because uh, a bunch of very diverse um, international organizations with very different mandates uh, came together and agreed on a set of what actually were some very tough recommendations. And it was remarkable because they were addressed to the G20, which was a recognition of the big geopolitical shifts that had taken place and how, how the world had changed, including the world of, of food and agriculture. And it was remarkable in that just about everybody agreed, or if they didn't agree, they didn't say anything about it, 
um, that distorting domestic supports, um, border protection, export subsidies, and a lot of the policies that were being pursued by governments were actually uh, causing or exacerbating the, the volatility that people were, were concerned about. Um, so a lot of different things came together at that time. But uh, where are we now almost 10 years later? Well, there's some good news. Um, in 2015, uh, the WTO members agreed to eliminate export subsidies. That was uh, certainly one of the recommendations. Um, uh, AMOS, the Agricultural Market Information System, which was set up in response to the, the recommendations, has been uh, going from strength to strength. And I think in this COVID crisis has certainly demonstrated its um, value. Uh, we have also seen some progress on market access, um, although it has come probably mainly through unilateral, bilateral and regional developments and not really through multilateral developments, but there is progress. But at the heart of the recommendations uh, that were made at that time uh, was really a call for a move away from the most distorting uh, types of, of, of support uh, and um, uh, towards uh, policies that would uh, facilitate and assist with innovation, resilience, sustainability, climate, food security, a lot of the things that, that governments were, were talking about. And in this respect, I think it would be fair to say that we, we see at best a very, very mixed pic picture uh, over the past uh, 10 years. So I'll, I'll try to just very briefly give a flavor of what I, how I see it. Um, a lot of the OECD countries had already undertaken some quite major reforms, but what we see since 2010, 2011 is that they're kind of treading water. Um, they've kept the, the levels of support lowish, you know, they haven't started to edge back up again, but we have seen some backsliding in terms of the types of policies and we see increased resort to more coupled measures, countercyclical measures and that kind of thing. So that's one group, at least for the major economies within that group. Um, among some of the emerging economies, what we see, and um, partly in response to the 27-8 price crisis, we see them actually ramping up support. So to the point where, according to the OECD measures, now some of them are reporting levels of support, certainly in, uh, more than the OECD average and more than some very important OECD um, countries. And most of that support is in the form of, of either of market price support or of, of, of input subsidies, which is a little bit um, is a little bit concerning. And then we have a group of large exporting countries who, you know, as usual, steadfastly um, keep their markets open, hope that others will keep their markets open and invest in innovation and uh, disaster and risk management, but not, not, much, not, much, more than, not much more than that. Um, according to the OECD figures, there's uh, support currently to the sector is over 700 billion US dollars, and there's actually um, almost $100 billion of negative um, market price support uh, as, as well. And most of it, the majority of that support is still of the most kind of distorting kind. So in, in conclusion, it seems to me that there's quite a large disconnect between what governments agreed to do in 2011, what they say they want to do with their policies and the actual policies that they uh, that they deploy. And this is particularly flagrant with respect to the very big volume of market distorting policies and, and variable input subsidies that we still see um, out there. Um, we're still failing to get support to the people that need it most, the small, the small holders, the most vulnerable and, and, and the poorest. So there's, there's an urgent need for a reset um, to really begin that, that transformation. And much of it can be done with what I call win-win measures. So measures that are good for trade or that at least get out of the way of trade, um, but that are also good for farmers, for consumers, for the environment, for climate um, and, and all the rest of it. And I'm looking forward to be able to talk a little bit more about those things in the next rounds of questions. So back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Carmel, um, and uh, for, for this overview uh, uh, of the situation uh, with uh, using the 2011 lenses, in a sense. Uh, Gerda, Car Carmel spoke about a, a reset and uh, taking into account good for trade and good for other 
concerns and goals. And obviously, food security would be a central goal. I mean, we had a session on this uh, uh, yesterday, and central goal reflected in UN United Nations SDG 2. Uh, and the COVID-19 crisis had immediate impacts on the food system, uh, both on supply and demand side, as we know. And governments adopted uh, measures such as tariff reduction, export restrictions, followed by measures to support farmers, including through uh, public stockholding programs. And, and beyond the short-term effects, uh, in your view, does the COVID-19 crisis change the long-term perspective on, on food security? and how uh, it could be addressed through strengthening of the multilateral disciplines, ensuring at the same time more open and distort less distorted trade. Thank you very much, Cedric. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, be part of this conference or <clears throat> in discussion. First of all, um, based on your question, let us just look at the Sustainable Development Goal number two again. End hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition, and promote sustainable agriculture. Although I only mentioned SD, SDG two, one should also look at goal one. End poverty in all its forms everywhere. Food security is a central goal enshrined in the mentioned goal as also indicated by you. Let us also look at the definition of food security. Food security, the state of having reliable access to sufficient quantity of affordable nutritious food. Important elements in achieving food security is supply, demand and affordability of food. The demand for food worldwide is increasing due to the increase in population. These also vary between developed and developing countries. Production of food is the main element in the demand side, but not, only the, on, but not the only element. It should be production by small, medium and large scale farmers without gender inequality. Also very important is open borders and no export restrictions. Efficient logistical value change. This is where the trade facilitation agreement will be important. With regard to reliable access and affordability, trade is a major element. Historically, Trade has proven to be an engine for development and poverty reduction by boosting growth, particularly in developing countries. It is my view that trade should be a major element of sector strategies on national level. That the multilateral trading system should be strengthened to support inclusive growth job creation and poverty reduction. That trade costs should be reduced, supply side capacity and the necessary infrastructure be developed, particularly in developing countries. Also important is export diversification and value addition to agricultural products. Other factors in my view, that has an influence on trade and is not necessarily included in this discussion today are rules of origin, non-tariff barriers or measures, sanitary and phytosanitary measures and services. Progress on addressing food security, which is going to be a major issue for many countries in the context of COVID-19 is extremely urgent. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization's global report on food crisis reveals scope for food crisis as COVID-19 poses new risks to vulnerable countries. The report indicates that at the close of 2019, 135 million people across 55 countries and territories experienced acute food 
insecurity. Additionally, in the 55 food crisis countries covered by the report, 75 million children were stunted and 17 million suffered from wasting in 2019. If we look at the current WTO agreement on agriculture, it has three legs, namely market access, domestic support and export competition. In line with the agreement on further reform as contained in Article 20 of the Agreement on Agriculture, that recalls members' objective of a fair and market-orientated agricultural trading system, and in order to assist with addressing food security, it is my view that the following elements need to be considered in ensuing more open and less distorting trade. In the area of market access, tariff escalation. The tariff levels on processed agriculture is still way higher than on the primary product. And there's a need for developing and least developed countries to move up the value chain. Tariff reduction. Change, changing trade flows are reshaping markets for food and agriculture along with preferential food trade deals. It is thus necessary to also look at the levels of tariffs where we see very high tariffs on certain products which are still, even after the euro wide round, still at the very high level. So it's a further need to look at those. Then there is the market access quotas. What is the role of those quotas? Are there still a role for that quotas? And we have to look at the administration of these quotas. The effectiveness of the special safeguard measure for developing countries. The current system is very complex and difficult to implement and use. In the area of domestic support, the main element stays the effective reduction of trade distorting domestic support, as also mentioned by Carmel. Work done by some members of the World Trade Organization indicated that trade distorting domestic support entitlements for all WTO members measured by the aggregate measure of support and the de minimis has more than doubled from 322 billion US dollars in 2001 to approximately 740 million dollars in 2016. Although this is talking about entitlement, it also indicates that there is still scope to increase current uh, domestic support that is currently being used can be increased up to these levels. Then the green box. Important for me is to keep the green box clear of any trade distorting support. There should not be changes to allow any of such support to be, be taken into the green box. Public stock holding. It is now not a matter of st public stock holding forms part of the ongoing WTO negotiations. Some member countries continue to seek negotiated outcomes on our current WTO farm subsidy rules affect their ability to procure food for public stocks while others arguing for greater flexibility in this area, WTO members have agreed to pursue a permanent solution, which is still on the cards and which is ongoing. In the last section, export competition, as uh, Carmel has mentioned, export subsidies has been eliminated, but we have still export restrictions that is available to members to use. The implementation of export restrictions on by large food exporting countries in times of food price hikes 
And as seen during the recent COVID-19 leads to challenges by net food importing developing countries and other low income countries in procuring food on a global market during such times. Thank you, Cedric. You're on mute, Cedric. Sorry. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Gerda, for, for your reply and very detailed um, description of the different measures that could be envisaged. And uh, let me now turn to uh, Sofia. Uh, some of your work has uh, also, and still discussing, still focusing on food security, you, you have worked on the notion of resilient food security, including as a member of the high level panel on food security and nutrition under the Committee for Food Security. And, and what would be on your side, the, the policy recommendations to manage adequately the main risks to be faced by farming communities in the coming decades? And how could such effective risk management policies be best promoted through multilateral disciplines aimed at reducing trade distortion? Thank you, Cedric, and um, thank you to the WTO. Canada, not sure this got me to there. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to maybe step back a little bit from the kinds of recommendations that Gerda was making um, and that Carmel was talking about because it's difficult to have the conversation about what we should do. Um, and I think maybe that's partly why I'm here because to some extent I disagree with some of the premises that we have. And I think it'll be helpful to, to think that through together. So it's a great question and it's a much bigger than five minute question, but to, to maybe focus on two things. What are the risks facing farming communities? And, and it's interesting to focus on farming communities, both because I think a lot of the risks they face have not been well addressed by trade rules. And also because of course, agriculture is much larger than farming communities. And that's one of the things that's often hidden, I think in the negotiations and in the analysis of what we need that we're not looking at the, at the chain. Um, and, and not just not at the chain, but at all the people who are affected, um, maybe not in the commerce of agriculture, but by the other services that agriculture provides. And then the second question, which I think will come up again later in the session as well, um, just what is a trade distortion, which I think Carmel and I have been arguing about for at least 20 years. And um, fruitfully, I think, trying to, to get to understand what it is that we're aiming to achieve um, and where the distortions lie. So in terms of the risks, um, just a few of them that come to my mind when I think about them, they're not new, but I don't see them going away. One is secure access to land. And um, there are a lot of threats to land ownership um, and those threats change with time, but they often leave farming communities vulnerable to pressures that are coming from outside. Um, in the US, we're dealing still with the recent history of, of, of structural racism in the agricultural system that has systematically excluded certain people from the land. Women around the world are still dealing with systematic exclusion from safe access to land in many countries. Um, but there are also trade and investment agreements that have allowed that insecurity to worsen, that have complicated the local and national conversation about land access by introducing um, other interests, other pressures, other ways in which um, money can be brought in. And the reason it creates a problem is that you, your conversation about the trade investment agreement is not involving the people whose land is being affected. So you have this disconnect between where trade is discussed and negotiated and where some of its impacts will be felt um, in the farming communities. We have the risk of crop failure which climate change has made considerably more complicated and also in a lot of places, exhaustion of land, exhaustion of fresh water, lack of sufficient genetic diversity. Um, and that's an, an age old risk to farming communities. And again, um, difficult to protect farmers from that and meet the trade distorting, um, non-trade distorting requirements that we have wanted to see um, through the trade agreements. The, the financial risks, um, won't say a lot about them, but those are also changing age old risk, how to finance agriculture. 
and quite significant changes in where money's coming from, who's investing in land, and how land investment is managed in portfolios of, of um, bigger investments or broader investment portfolios, and how farming communities can continue to have some control, some say, in, in how their land is valued. It's challenged by a lot of investment agreements and to some extent by trade rules. A fourth risk is overproduction. That's another age old risk, which we didn't address at all in the agreement on agriculture. And it continues to be this risk. And it's a challenge for the rules because some places do need to grow more food and lots of places need to grow less of what they're growing or to change and end the subsidies that encourage production of crops that are not wanted. Um, and then the um, market concentration risks, which again, I've been, Bill, I've been talking about for a long time, and maybe that will bring us into distortion and make it almost the end of my time already. Um, if we want to deal with trade distortions, then we have to look at where the distortions are coming from. And the agreement on agriculture looked closely and importantly at the sources of state distortion, but not at oligopoly power, not at the forces that were driving concentration, and not at some of the forces that have exacerbated inequality, which I would say in a positive way is much more present in our agenda now than say 10 years ago when we faced the um, price volatility crisis in, um, from 27 onwards, 2007 onwards, um, but it's still not dealt with. And so if you open and um, if, you, if you open your markets and assume everyone should be trading at a single world price, then you have to look at where else in the market the price is being distorted and how you're going to manage the failure, um, the lack of purchasing power in a lot of that market to exercise its voice and do what it's supposed to do if the market is working as it should. So yeah, practical measures to manage risk. I've not given you at all, Cedric, but I have, I'll just maybe finish saying, um, I think that the start would have to be in a bigger conversation about who's bearing the risk. At the moment, farmers and farming bears a lot of risk and the public bails them out. And we wring our hands because it costs a lot of money for the public to bail them out. And somewhere in there, there's a lot of money being made and a lot of a failure of accountability for what the system ought to be delivering and how the risk might be better shared across the system. And I think that's where the focus of, of the management tools we have right now, the answers all lie in the public budget and, and not necessarily where, um, you know, not in a distribution of risk across the value chain in an appropriate way. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia, for, for, your, for your reply, which I think is, is very complementary and obviously with, with different perspective from some of the previous uh, replies. And this is why we are here to exchange views with different perspective and, and try to, uh, to see uh, how we can look at the same uh, object, which is the priority of disciplines uh, with our different angles. And I think definitely that risk management is uh, indeed uh, something which is important when you consider the uh, agricultural sector. And um, as a matter of fact, also looking from a risk management angle, uh, Darcy, we, we are now witnessing the rapid development of new technologies, especially in the information communication technologies area. And, and they are generally considered as a very important tool to help farmers and the food industry better manage their risks in the future. So how could agricultural policies support the most effective utilization of data-driven information and communication technologies in the ag sector at the micro and micro and macro levels? And how could or should future multilateral disciplines integrate this dimension substantive wise, as well as process wise? And here I mean also uh, as part of the WTO monitoring function. So looking at how we can help farmers, but also how we can help the WTO looking at the disciplines that help farmers. Not an easy question, I, I agree, but Darcy, I'm sure you, you, do, you do a great job. Well, thank you very much, Cedric, and thanks to the WTO for hosting this conversation um, and to fellow panelists who have uh, raised a number of questions that I think fit nicely in, in this conversation. And I'm not sure I have answers, but maybe raising some more questions and thinking about how some of the WTO disciplines um, fit together. But just coming back to this question of data and communications technology, 
Um, you know, I think if I think back to days of negotiating during the Doha round, when we were talking about competitiveness and market access, we almost always framed that conversation in the context of access to other markets for agricultural products. But if you look at the last uh, few years in particular, where we've seen some very low commodity prices, competitiveness and um, financial returns for farmers participating in these global markets um, has depended in part not on selling the end product, but on being able to employ technologies to be more efficient in the production of that product itself and really using um, those new technologies to, uh, to control cost, to uh, have a better sense of what they were producing, what their inputs were, how to, to access them and monitor them. And you know, I, I was speaking with a group of farmers yesterday who said the real difference between um, profit and loss in the last few years has been um, access to good market information and financial services tools for forward contracting and pricing of grain, um, crop insurance tools where there have been extreme weather events, you know, some of those risks Sophia talked about of, you know, participating in the ag system. Um, can we help to, to mitigate that? Um, but also the use of precision agriculture and really bringing down um, the cost and the use of, uh, you know, chemical inputs, seeds, water usage, uh, tillage, et cetera, that has reduced use of fuel and agricultural equipment, for example. And, you know, there are a lot of other sort of risks and questions that come with that. Um, and those are being actively debated in the US and in markets elsewhere that while those digital tools give you great ability to um, perhaps be more efficient in your application, there are also questions of who owns then the data about your farm. Um, how does that, that data move? Does packaging the purchase of inputs and data with particular providers of goods and services, does it create more opportunities for farmers in terms of where they purchase and how they think about their inputs and market their grain or does it create fewer uh, in terms of the, the market participation and, and their power to use that data in new and innovative ways. And those are questions um, that I think need to be, uh, still need to be explored. Um, but those aren't necessarily um, questions that are, are addressed in the agreement in agriculture. Um, in fact, you know, agreements on, on digital trade, on data flows and localization, um, how that data can be used in flow and how farmers can manage it uh, might be outside of the agreement on agriculture itself. And then of course there's access to the technologies and as the price of some of the sensors and other like physical inputs that help with the use of precision agriculture go down, um, can we reduce tariffs on those things to make them more accessible to farmers of different sizes, different scales and different crops? Um, and is that an environmental goods and services question? Um, can farmers access professional services to make sure they're employing those tools in the most efficient way? And so that, that's critical as well. But I think what's partly interesting about these technologies is that they may bring efficiency and different choices to individual farmers, but they also create the underpinnings for an ecosystem services market. So as we start to uh, measure reductions in input, increases in soil carbon, um, the biodiversity impact of adopting more regenerative practices, uh, I think there's a real interest in farmers being able to use um, to market those gains and to use those as a, a, a new income stream to help mitigate against volatility in crops themselves and be paid for carbon reduction for biodiversity gains, et cetera. Uh, but there are questions then about the trade, how the trading system would underpin that as well. So are there agreements between countries about how you measure? Um, you know, what is measured? Will national markets for these become internationally interoperable? And how do we think about uh, the WTO's role with other inst international institutions, providing again, more opportunities for farmers to participate um, and to make sure that there's integrity in the system and that where farmers are being paid for those services, they're actually achieving the gains in carbon or biodiversity, et cetera. 
And the last point I would make is that, you know, I've talked about environmental goods and services being important, um, thinking about our trade rules there being important for this market, um, data flows and localization. But I think we have some questions to raise about domestic support as well. And that traditionally we've thought about input subsidies as, you know, conferring a competitive advantage on particular farmers. But frankly, there's probably going to need to be some national support for, uh, for broadband, for example, in rural areas for, for farmers to be able to participate um, in these markets or use these digital tools. And employing more, greater use of digital agriculture has societal benefits if it helps farmers to reduce uh, their carbon emissions, for example. Um, so how do we think about government interaction with private markets to provide some of the infrastructure for digital agriculture? And do we need to better define um, what those subsidies look like and which ones are trade distorting and which ones are supportive of some global environmental goals? So again, um, uh, going through uh, eating up time here, but those are some of the bigger questions I've been thinking about in terms of um, how we uh, address some of those environmental issues on the communications and the data side. So, thank you. Thanks, Darcy. Indeed, you, you probably asked more questions than you provided replies. So you, you did what you promised you would do. And I think this is very interesting and uh, stimulating uh, elements as, as uh, all of you. Um, it, as a matter of fact, it, it shows how the world is complex, obviously. And sometimes I, I think about the colleagues who participated in negotiation of the agreement on agriculture it looks like backwards. It seems so simple in a sense. And now we have all these issues and connections. Uh, and speaking again about coming to new trends, Janvier, we, we had also another trend which has been characterized, uh, has characterized the international food trading system, uh, which is the growing importance of global value chain and, and trading process product. And you alluded to it in your first intervention. And how do you see this trend evolving in the coming years? And how could multilateral trading, trading disciplines uh, capture this uh, evolution in relation to agricultural and, and food products? Okay. Um, what uh, globalization as we know it has meant that many countries really relied on uh, long uh, value and distribution chains, which means that uh, food security in, uh, especially in uh, net food importing countries that was heavily reliant on uh, the smoothness of uh, international trade. Uh, but of course, we know that uh, international trade is not as smooth as uh, it should be, at least theoretically. There are uh, frictions, uh, there are uh, hiccups, uh, as we observed in uh, 2007 and 2008, I mean, the years following the food uh, crisis which really produced some catastrophic uh, uh, consequences in a number of developing countries where we know there were riots, uh, people died uh, because they could not uh, access food, which was coming through these international market channels. So we have seen now with COVID-19, uh, COVID there has been now some talk about uh, strategic, self-sufficiency. Uh, uh, I'm trying to be very careful here because I know I'm discussing in, in a WTO uh, forum, uh, but this is, it's talk that is going on. Uh, we have, I live in Europe, I live in Geneva. Uh, I've heard many countries in Europe talking about this. We all know uh, the problems that uh, we, experience that, that countries experience uh, with respect to medical medical equipment for example when uh, covid uh, uh, was raging especially at the beginning of the pandemic so this problem now is not just the problem that is relevant for developing countries but even developed countries when i talk about this self-sufficiency strategic self-sufficiency 
I'm not talking about some small developing country talking about this. I'm really talking about the EU. I'm talking about the big, uh, the big players uh, in the world market. And it would be really naive uh, to believe that uh, domestically produced goods uh, are a perfect substitute of uh, imports. Uh, it would be very naive to, to believe in that. So now, if this feeling, we don't know what's going to happen because sometimes problems come and go and then we go back to business as usual. But if this feeling uh, persists, maybe there'll be some emergence uh, of uh, uh, new ideas, maybe about emergence of, actually it's already being talked about, of shorter value chains, of shorter uh, distribution chains. Okay, just to be, uh, to be more, uh, we've been talking about food security. Food security, for example, if you rely on food that you import 10,000 kilometers away from you, it's more exposed to these vagaries of international trade than if you just either producing it uh, yourself or if you are importing it from, uh, uh, from your neighbor. Of course, here yeah, I'm not implying that every country now should go into the production of its own food. Some countries might not be uh, competitive in the production of food. Some countries might not even be able, they don't have land to produce food. But where opportunities are, I think these are things that might be uh, considered. Uh, for example, let me give the example of Africa, where we have uh, food imports, which uh, go beyond $70 billion every year. But this food that is imported could be produced within, uh, within the region. Africa has the, uh, the largest uh, unexploited land, fertile land, which can produce most of the food that uh, the continent is uh, importing, which can produce a uh, competitively, let me uh, add this one, competitively. It's not just about producing, it's being able to produce it competitively. And uh, the same could be said about uh, uh, the Caribbean, uh, CARICOM, okay. So maybe, Maybe this whole idea of uh, long value chains, as we have seen it, might see some might see some change. Maybe now focusing on regional, more on regional value chains. I think that's when Europe, for example, talks about self sufficiency. It doesn't really mean that uh, Switzerland or France is just going to produce everything, but it's probably producing it within the region where it is easier uh, accessed. So the same could be said about, let's say, Africa. Instead of importing all these quantities of rice, for example, there are many countries in Africa that have a huge uh, unexploited land where they can grow rice uh, in, a competitive, in a competitive way. So I think now the multilateral uh, trading system should really try to look at this very carefully. How do we now look at, uh, uh, especially, here I'm really focusing more on developing countries. How can they look at regional integration in a different way? Not just saying that, uh, uh, I know of course you cover regional integration, but how can we now look at it in a, with, new, with a new kind of eyes, trying to look at issues like uh, these uh, issues of regional value chains? Uh, what does this imply in terms of uh, uh, international trade, uh, what would these changes, because this would imply changes in international trade, what would these changes mean uh, for exporting countries, for importing countries? Uh, so I think there is a whole uh, interesting debate that we can, uh, that we can look at, and uh, hopefully uh, maybe this can contribute to the, because really the bottom line is trying to help countries uh, to achieve uh, food security, achieve prosperity. So maybe this could help in, uh, in some way. So, yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Janvier, for, for your, your reply, which also addressed, uh, I think, food security, and, and also this question of interaction between multilateral trading rules and regional integration, which is uh, important, including for, for the African continent, definitely. Uh, Sophia, as, as we have seen, and I, here I want maybe to, to come back to a point you, you have made and follow up, um, sustainable food production systems and resilient ag pro agricultural practices 
will be very important in the coming decades. Uh, but environmental issues, water and land management, biodiversity, greenhouse gas emissions are, are very complex issues and, and very dependent on local conditions. And I think this is a point Darcy made too. Um, and at the same time, uh, open and less trade distorting international trade clearly contributes to an optimal allocation of resources, including natural resources. Um, and in this context, how do you see the interface between global multilateral trade, trading disciplines applicable to all and measures tailored to local conditions toward more sustainable and resilient agricultural practices? So how do you see this relation between global rules and, and tailor kind of local uh, disciplines in order to deliver these environmental outcomes? Okay, thank you, Cédric, for that. And thanks, everyone. It's, um, it's a rich conversation. I, well, I'm going to first say um, just about the assumption about the optimal allocation of resources through, um, through open international trade. And, and just, just to maybe repeat the points about, you know, until we are counting pollution, until we are ensuring that agricultural workers are paid a decent wage, we just reduced that wage in the United States in the last month, even though they're some of the poorest paid people in the country, until we have the highest environmental standards protected in the value chain, until we have real meaningful competition law, it's gonna be very difficult to do what our trade theory wants us to do in terms of allocating our resources. So I think the WTO has to be a place where it's a political forum. It's not a place to practice economic ideology. It's a practice, it's a, it's a political place where countries come with challenges and problems that they need to be able to talk about in context, this context of the local um, regional realities. And I think, I mean, most countries, as, as um, Jean-Vier was saying, they want to protect their food security, they want to develop, they want to, to reduce poverty, they want to import, they want to export, um, they want a safe environment. And, and I think that a lot of the conversation, if we start with the trade distortions defined too narrowly, there isn't an honest conversation about what is politically possible. And so we spend a great deal of time saying, oh, you know, the US is hypocritical and India is hypocritical. And to some extent, every country in the conversation is being somewhat hypocritical because there are other forums where they're making commitments that will be very difficult to meet if they're going to make maximum trade opening in the way defined in the agreement is, is, is going to, uh, is, is the guideline. So, so anyway, grappling with that, and it comes back to the first question you posed to me, Cédric, this concept of resilient global food security. Um, so this is just my sort of thinking about this for too long, probably, and having a lot of conversations about it. One is I think the local global interface has to think about what I call consonance. So if you, if you think about dissonance, or you think about a, an orchestra and the, the pieces of the parts that people get, the violin doesn't play the same score as the flute, but the two together make sense. And I feel that the agreement on agriculture was dissonant with a lot of the local pressures on agriculture and, and food and farm systems. It dealt with a lot of a real problem transatlantically. It dealt with maybe some other bigger problems for, for the Cairns group, not entirely to the Cairns group satisfaction, but it didn't, it didn't really deal with the role agriculture could play in the development of a lot of the world. And so, and so it was dissonant with what countries wanted. And it was dissonant, honestly, with farmers in the US and Europe and elsewhere who were protesting just as vociferously as the farmers in India are protesting today. And that, and that political context sort of, it just needs to be more present. It's not that that dictates it all. The multilateral has to overcome that. But the consonance means that you, you don't want to undermine your efforts, for example, to, to improve soil health with a trade or an investment rule that doesn't allow you to protect that or, or the rules you have for um, working conditions for farmers or um, farm laborers. A second of the principles in this notion of resilient global food security is, is accountability. So this better, better ways. And I think this idea of the, the regional integration we have, which in um, different places is proceeding with more or less public engagement, but a, but a public engagement in what we're doing and understanding of trade instead of we saw over the last 20 years a kind of 
almost almost absurd move towards secrecy where you know you had to put your cell phone in outside the door to be allowed into a room to look at a text having sworn a blood oath that you'd never talk about it outside this isn't a way to inspire trust and confidence and i think it feeds the very xenophobic trade discourse that a lot of our countries have lived with in these most recent years so i think i think some transparency would also help to set, you know, um, it makes sense that investors want some kind of protection for their investment and that they go to the multilateral and system and say, I need some way to protect the money that I'm putting in this other country. But it also makes sense that the public interest would be defended and that the public would want to know that having struggled often for decades to say, get some improvement in working condition or to secure some kind of subsidy of the kind Darcy's talking about into better soil health perhaps, or better use of the freshwater system, you don't want that jeopardized in the multilateral um, realm. And, and you might not understand all the other aspects either. That's this, the third element in the whole concept of resilient global food security is this adaptive governance idea. Adaptive governance, because we're dealing with multiple systems that interact and they interact on different time scales. One of the environment's problems is that it moves and changes too slowly to be captured in, in the market system, which is doing many things very well, but it's not doing a good job of capturing long-term costs for us. And, and those systems mean we also don't entirely understand when and how shocks will come and how big they'll be. Are we going to have a locust infestation at the same time as we're gonna shut all our borders because of a pandemic? Are we gonna have a pandemic in a year like this where we had pretty good food supplies? So are we gonna have a pandemic in a year where actually the harvests are pretty poor and a lot of food has to move quickly. We don't know. And so we, we, we want the multilateral trade system to be um, helping us to manage that back to the risk management question, um, not, not optimizing for the best efficiency at the, you know, in, when all the conditions are working, but, um, but thinking about resilience, which means thinking about redundancy. And again, as Jean-Jay said, back to, where else, how can I pivot? It's not because I need a local only or a global only, but how can those be supporting each other? And how can I make sure that my effort to, 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 to improve efficiency in a global value chain has not rendered my local and regional responses, um, hasn't driven them out of business, hasn't made it impossible for those to also thrive. I'll leave it there, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Sophia, uh, for, for these reflections, which I think went a little bit beyond my, my question, but I think this is this is a purpose. I mean, you 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 play you play your instruments in, in you play them very well. And I think this whole kind of uh, music so different is, is is very consonant, if I if I may. Um Darcy, I uh, coming back to you, and um here I'm going to use a little bit of the uh, usual WTO uh, agreement on agriculture terminology. Um, some observers consider that uh, while domestic support is, is key priority to be addressed by WTO members, the, the reduction of tariffs at the multilateral level may have become less relevant uh, due to both proliferation of bilateral and, and regional trade agreements and also to the growing importance of non-tariff barriers. So, so what are your, your views on, on, on these observations and how, yeah, what would you like to say about it? Uh, sure, thank you, Cedric. I think in many ways, I largely agree with this, that we've had a number of um, bilateral and regional agreements that have been pretty effective at addressing tariffs, but usually they don't deal with domestic support. And I think, you know, we heard Gerda say that the overall use of AMS has more than doubled in the last um, several years of, of you know, trade distorting, dis dis trade distorting domestic support. And we need to uh, be able to, to focus on that. And I think there's no question that it's not the same countries, it's not the same uh, delivery or types of support that you know, when we launched the Doha round were um, the, the major providers of domestic support versus now, you know, not that domestic support has gone away, um, you know, in the US even, um, or, or other countries, but that more countries are actively participating. 
and that more countries are um, exporting a wider variety and value of ag products and really have the ability through their domestic policies to create um, more distortions in global markets. So I think you do need the multilateral system to focus on how we um, address domestic support. And again, I think we have to look more broadly on what support is there. So transparency, a point Sophia made, I think is important here on um, transparency and reporting, um, the types of domestic support, how it's being delivered, the volume, the number of products supported. Um, I think we could use a, um, a context sort of reset to say, where are we? And what is it, are broadly is the impact of that? Um, I also would agree that SPS measures, um, technical barriers in form of licensing, certification requirements, et cetera, can often be more prohibitive of trade than tariffs themselves. You can often trade over a tariff, depending on that tariff level, but particular um, SPS or licensing or certification measures might simply mean your product has no access at all. Um, and those types of barriers can be very difficult to um, negotiate your way through. Um, figuring out the motivation for those tariffs. Is it to protect markets? Is it because capacity to implement more nuanced SPS measures or employ certain mitigation techniques are expensive or hard for certain um, countries to implement? So, um, you know, I do think those barriers are proliferating. Um, sustainability requirements to import and export. Those are important for environmental reasons. They can be difficult for compliance reasons and market access reasons. Um, those use more, need more attention as well. And on the tariff side, I think it is true that there have been a number of um, bilateral regional um, agreements that have successfully brought down tariffs. But I think we have to ask ourselves the question, who's participating in those agreements and are those tariff benefits, is expanded market access really happening for everyone? Because not all countries are invited to those, to those tables. And what we want is um, more access to markets and ability to participate in global markets for more of the agricultural sector globally. So I think a key question for me is how do we use that expanded market access from those um, regional agreements, for example, can we multilateralize them or at least expand them a little bit? Um, if you take an agreement like the TPP, uh, which the United States is no longer participating in, but I spent a long time <laughs> negotiating, um, you know, some key markets that were very close to agriculture opened and they opened to some of the most competitive exporters of those products. So take, um, Japan's dairy market or the beef market, for example, where there were very high tariffs that are being brought down. Once you open on a tariff basis, again, I think products still covered by quota, et cetera, may be an exception to this rule. You would have to figure out how to deal with them. But once you've opened your market to some of the most competitive exporters, adding the number of countries that can export may not change much the competition that your domestic farmers are facing, but it might open real opportunities for countries who currently are not participating. So can we look at some of those regional deals and once they have been implemented, once the first movers um, that were willing to open those markets have had a chance to implement, can that same access package be expanded to a wider group of countries? Can we think about doing agriculture on a plurilateral type basis and use some of those regional agreements and the tariff access provided as the, the starting point for companies, for countries to join. And, you know, I think we have to ask ourselves questions about how we expand um, that market access. If we did do a plurilateral like that, is it on an MFN basis? Um, what are the countries that would want to join onto that access asked to do? Um, in return in terms of opening their own market and on what timetable. Um, but I think we do have to think about how can we expand tariff benefits to a wider group? How can we think about the structure for negotiating or expanding that access? Um, and does it need to look like the, um, the way we structured those negotiations in the past? Or can we think outside the box a little bit? 
Thank, thank you, Darcy. And, and indeed, uh, again, as as previous speakers, you really helped us thinking out of the box, I think, and, and looking at, at those issues with a broader perspective. And this is precisely the purpose of this of this session. And, and Carmel, uh, in, in the same vein, vein and, and more globally, would you say that that the current architecture of the agreement on agriculture remains a good basis for the development of, of multilateral disciplines in, in, in 2050. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Cedric. In fact, I, I, what I'm really itching to do is to go back to some of the, the earlier discussion, but we've all gone over our time already. So I'll stick with the question you've, you've, you've posed to me. Um, well, I think I'm sure we'll... you'll find a way to, to reply to the questions, <laughs> knowing <laughs> pretty well, Carmel. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I think that the architecture, the broad architect, architecture in terms of the pillars is still very pertinent and still um, and still very important in that very in that very broad sense. It was innovative. Uh, the domestic bringing the domestic support in, in particular was extremely important and had never been done before. And there's clearly still a need to continue with that. Um, where uh, there might be something missing, I think, relates to export restrictions. And in fact, going through my first comments, I forgot to mention export restrictions. Um, but we have seen through the 7-8 food crisis, and we've seen it this year with COVID as well, um, that this can be a big issue in, in international trade. And maybe that's something we, we need to add as another pillar or part of a, an existing pillar or, or something like that. But let me go back to the domestic support disciplines, because of the three, um, while it's um, maybe the most innovative, it's also probably the one that's most um, in need of, of uh, some kind of um, being brought up to date or um, um, it's, it's, I think, less fit for purpose than, 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 the, other, than the other pillars are. Why? Um, for example, if you consider that uh, the market price for uh, disciplines that are a big part of the AMS are based off fixed reference prices that now go back to 86, 88, more than 30 years ago. Um, and that the resulting calculations of market price support actually bear um, very little relation to what the situation is uh, today. They're, they're essentially devoid of, of, of economic meaning. I know they have legal meaning um, and they have political meaning, but they really don't have any uh, economic meaning. So we, we have a completely inaccurate picture of what the world looks like today in terms of agricultural policy and agricultural trade policy. We have vast amounts of water um, in, in the disciplines. There are lots of papers out there showing it, but it's, 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 a, it's enormous, which means there are many, many countries who could really ramp up um, their levels of, of support and protection and still be in, in, in compliance. Um, we have anomalies like the fact that um, the bound total AMS commitments are in nominal absolute amounts of money, while the de minimis are in terms of value of production. And these things are going in, in, in different directions and, you know, arguably de minimis, if it isn't already more important, will over time, certainly looking out to 2050, be the thing um, that matters and that determines um, uh, behavior. And I guess, you know, fundamentally, um, the domestic support discipline right now is not actually being successful in reining in um, the most distorting and the most damaging behaviors. And when I say that, I mean also most damaging in terms of environment and climate and, 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 and so on. And that's maybe the discussion I'd like to pursue with Sophia, but we don't have time today. So what, what would a, a, an agreement fit for um, looking forward to 2050 look like? Well, uh, it seems to me, an evidence that it should be based off a picture of the world today, that we need an up-to-date um, uh, description of you know, where the world is and what countries are, are, are doing. It seems to me that also thinking of disciplines, you know, once you had that picture, you would then require of countries an effort that was commensurate with what their starting points were. Um, I think that would be very important because in the, the, um, uh, in the 94 agreement, uh, we kind of institutionalized and legalized, in fact, some very, very high levels of, of, of support. Uh, a new agreement should attempt to exploit what I'm calling the, the win-wins. And those are the, the, um, the, those are the rolling back of 
measures that are damaging to trade and damaging to the environment and climate and maybe a lot of other things too um, and shifting towards policies that are, are much better in all, in all of those um, dimensions and I think there's huge scope for that um, uh, and we could maybe pursue that um, as the conversation go, goes on. I think a new agreement's really got to address the sense of, of, of I think what I said already would actually constitute a rebalancing, but we do need to explicitly address the sense of grievance, whether those grievances will be either perceived as to you know, what the outcomes of the original agreement were. So, um, Cedric, you asked us not to do advertising, um, but I'm going to do a tiny bit of advertising. I've been working with a group of former trade negotiators, academics, um, uh, government officials for the past year, and we, we have produced a paper with some quite detailed um, proposals for how one might um, go forward. It's not published yet, hopefully it will be published soon, um, but if I can have just a minute or two, let me give you a flavour of, of what we think, you know, one of the options we propose for domestic support might be um, in the context of that paper. So first of all, we would have a new database um, and the measurements of market price support would be based on something as current as possible. So the most recent data or moving average or an Olympian average or, 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 or whatever, but I think that's an absolute um, necessity. Uh, it would aim to uh, discipline all of the most distorting and most damaging. I, 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 I take great care to say distorting and damaging because what's distorting to trade is very often very damaging also to, to the environment. But a new agreement should, should, um, should attempt to discipline all of those distorting and damaging um, measures. Uh, it should seek convergence. Um, so by using a Swiss formula or a tiered system of reduction or whatever, but the idea would be that countries would aim uh, to sort of end up eventually uh, in the same place. Um, we would propose some revisions of the, the green box to make absolutely sure um, that the kind of positive policy interventions that governments need to be able to put in place for food security, for environment, for climate um, are actually uh, possible and properly uh, framed within, uh, within the, 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 the green box and that there really is um, scope for all of that spending on resilience, on innovation, on sustainability, on climate that's, that's needed. Um, we think that the measures the, or the changes that we're proposing would um, uh, pretty much solve the issues around public stockholding and, and, and domestic food aid because uh, first of all you'd be basing uh, calculations from most recent up-to-date uh, data and we would also clarify that in the event that you have a public procurement system for domestic food aid um, that uh, is using uh, administered prices that are lower than international prices there simply isn't any issue um, we would also seek to clarify that um, uh, domestic food aid that's delivered in the form of targeted uh, food distribution, cash, vouchers, any of those kinds of targeted measures that are, are pursued for food security simply are not the business of the green box or anything else and wouldn't even need to be, uh, wouldn't even need to be um, uh, notified. And finally, we would, we would, um, we would propose um, some um, attempt to discipline direct income support or decoupled um, income payments. So that in the event that um, you have such payments that are not clearly transitory in nature, meaning time limited and scheduled to be, um, uh, to be uh, phased out, uh, that in fact they should be subject to some discipline, maybe not as strong as for other types of, of support, but that at least they should be uh, they should be subject to some discipline. So this is just a, a you know one option for domestic support. It's it, it's based on the original um, architecture that we've come up with. We have lots of other ideas. Some of them are, are, are quite radical and move quite far away from all of that. Um, but I'll, 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 I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carmel. And, and immediately, because we now kind of run a little bit short of time, I'd like you to, to reply to some of the questions. Gerda, uh, the last question is, is, is for you. And, and again, looking forward and, and Bearing in mind the main challenges for the effective development in the agricultural sector in Africa, what would be your recommendations in terms of agricultural and trade policies that could impact decisively 
decisively sorry, on poverty reduction and provide greater opportunities for women? And how could multilateral disciplines uh, effectively contribute to the success of such policies, including in critical sectors such as cotton, which is, as we all know, a, a, an important topic in the, in the negotiation? Thank you, Cedric. Um, let me try and keep this short. Uh, and just start off to say <clears throat> that the agriculture sector is a key sector in the African continent and in the African economies. It employs a major part of the labor force and it could play a greater role in global food markets. Currently, Africa's contribution to global trade is around 4.5%, which is very low. And it's something that we could increase and should increase to the benefit of Africa. If we think back into account that 60% of arable land is in Africa, Africa should actually be the breadbasket for the world. But existing trade distortions, rising non-tariff measures has a negative impact on Africa's export interest. And also, if we look at that, agriculture has a comparative advantage. Most of the agriculture that is being done in Africa has a comparative advantage, but is negatively influenced by all of these measures. I'm not going to go back to all the things I've said in my first intervention of what I think should be addressed in negotiations. Just to also indicate that the situation in Africa is, is quite urgent to be looked at. If you look at the current the COVID influence, of the 135 million people that I mentioned that is experiencing acute food insecurity, 73 million of them lives in Africa. So income and job creation is extremely important and necessary. And food production is the main element on the demand side of food. Also production by small farmers, women farmers, large farmers, without any gender inequality. We have a lot of female farmers in Africa, but things like access to land has been mentioned. It is a difficult topic on the African continent. Trade cost is quite high and should be reduced. Supply side change should be looked at. Capacity building on the supply side. Increasing infrastructure in the, on the African continent. Export diversification. What we see is that Africa has a negative trade balance. It is importing more than it's exporting. And we need to diversify and get more exports out of Africa to the benefit of all the farmers on the African continent. We need open borders and no export restrictions. Efficient logistical value change, infrastructure development, as I've already mentioned. What I can also indicate is that the African continent and all the African countries on the continent has concluded the African Continental Free Trade Agreement in which the tariffs of 90% of the products has been significantly reduced. So the African continent has among itself started to look at further integration on the continent. Included in that is also development issues, development of infrastructure uh, for the whole continent. Then also, as I've mentioned, the issue of non-tariff barriers, sanitary phytosanitary, licensing, um, technical barriers to trade, standards, all of them are very difficult issues on the African continent and difficult and influencing the exports. 
Also, in my last comment that I want to make is around cotton. 60 to 70 percent of export revenue for the cotton fall is from, a, from cotton exports. The cotton fall being Benin, Burkina Faso, Chad and Mali has asked for and has made proposals for a specific addressing the issue of cotton. And a lot of discussion has taken place. And during the World Trade Organization's ministerial meeting that took place in Hong Kong in 2005, a decision was taken with regard to cotton to address cotton ambitiously, expeditiously, and specifically within the agriculture negotiations. The decision and importance of cotton was reconfirmed at future ministerial meetings. It is ever alarming to see that no solution to the problem has been agreed as yet. And I think it's something that has to get urgent attention to assist with the matter of cotton and the cotton trade. As I've already mentioned, other factors that has an influence is SPS, maximum residue, residue levels, pesticides, climate change, and all of those make it much more difficult for Africa to access markets. A rise in protectionist, discriminative, non-transparent, and non-scientifically based measures is a major cause of concern. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Gerda. And uh, I'm, I'm only facilitating. I'm, I'm not the chair here, uh, but I can see that you keep your good habits as a former delegate. Um, no, so we, we have little time. So I, the, now the rule of the game is going, I'm going to ask you questions, as many questions as possible, and we'll ask you to reply as, as, as quickly as possible. So it's going to be challenging, obviously. Uh, so let's one one minute uh, for for it just uh, reply to the question. I'm going to start with uh, Sofia. Uh, Sofia, the question is: How can we ensure a truly green green box in less than one minute? <laughs> Easy one. I I think uh, I think we're still we're still learning all the things that we need to do. So for me, it would be. Um, not trying to devise a green box around trade distorting or not. I don't think politically trade distorting is the concern that governments have at the foremost. They're very happy to distort trade for other reasons if they have to. So it would be better to, to have a truly green green box by trying to bring trade into the bigger national discussion of what they want and multilateral discussion of what we want instead of having trade isolated. And then I think it might be it, it would at least be a clearer conversation about what countries are striving for, and then maybe a better chance to exchange on, on what's effective. I agree with Carmel. There's a great deal of public money simply subsidizing shocking waste and, and destruction. Um, the trade agreement's not helping us to get at that, I feel. From where I'm sitting, that trade agreement is not helping me in my national conversation. I think it could. Thanks, thanks very much. And, and the other questions are not easier, I must, I must say. And, and the next one is, is for Darcy. Uh, Darcy, by, by 2050, can we expect one set of unified rules for agricultural and industrial subsidies? Um, well, 2050 is a long time uh, from now. Um, I don't know if I have the answer there, but I think that um, maybe closer sets of rules, if not unified, um, because I do think that um, the amount of trade, the volume, the value of agricultural trade has been um, increasing. And I think the questions we're asking ourselves on the industrial subsidy side too, about the role that they, they play in development, the need for transparency. So maybe what I would say is we might be heading for a, a more unified set of principles about what those disciplines should be, and then maybe more specific rules about those, how those principles are applied. 
Um, does that make sense? <laughs> that, that's a tough one. Um, but uh, maybe a better approach about the role that subsidies play and how they how they distort. I think that's going to be a lively area of discussion, both in industrial policy and agriculture over the next uh, several years. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Definitely not an easy one. To, to Janvier now, and again, the rule is, is one minute. Uh, speaking again about the uh, ACFTA, the uh, African Continent Free Trade Agreement, is it an opportunity to better integrate for African countries in WTO? Or on the contrary, is there a risk that African countries uh, spend too much time in internal negotiations in that region? Your views. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. Answering this in one minute is, uh, is, is, is it's, it's a gamble. No, I think the CFTA, the African uh, Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement, is an opportunity for the African countries to, first of all, integrate and really maybe scale up their production systems. This would benefit the African countries uh, themselves, but it could also benefit the world trading system because once the countries are uh, uh, more integrated, uh, for example, integrating production, uh, earlier I talked about integrating, for example, agriculture, for example, to create uh, uh, regional value chain. I think that could uh, benefit not only the, those countries, but it would create some clarity uh, at the international level. So it will, of course, I mean, knowing the history of African integration, it's going to take some time to really get to where they probably wish to be. Uh, but uh, I think they'll be, in the meantime, they'll be carrying out uh, parallel negotiations. Uh, I don't see how they can uh, do it otherwise. So there will be negotiations at the WTO. Uh, we talked about cotton now, for example. Uh, that will continue. But also the CFTA will uh, have its own, uh, its own uh, negotiate, negotiation framework, and uh, uh, we'll see that in the foreseeable future, I think. Th thank you, Janvier. And now, uh, Carmel, and again, your, your, your quick take on, on that one. We are entering with the COVID-19 in an era of massive governmental support to farmers. This is the question following COVID-19. Will it really be possible in this context to reform agriculture? Um, I think I'd prefer any of the other questions if I could. <laughs> um, look, we saw it back in, in the 2009 financial crisis as well, that measures that are, that are taken um, in an emergency then become very difficult uh, to, uh, to roll back. So uh, I think there are there are some there are some dangers uh, out there, um, but so far an awful lot of the measures that have been taken uh, have been more on the benign side, and we've seen an awful lot less of resort to export bans and export restrictions than we saw back in in, in two thousand and seven eight and, and and so on. So I'm not I'm not very I'm not very um, pessimistic. Uh, about that, but it is it is a situation that will need to be um, that will need to be uh, monitored carefully. I think. Thanks a lot. I I think we, we are just kind of coming to the end of our of our session. And, and Gerda, I, I will not, with all my apologies, ask you the last question. But in fact, it, it is maybe better than like that because it was really probably the most the trickiest one of all the questions. So let's do it this way. Janvier, Sofia, Darcy, Carmen, and Gerda, thanks so much for, for, your, for your participation. That was very stimulating exchange. I, I wish we had at least one full day to continue discussion and exchanges, but that is unfortunately not possible. So with your indulgence now, I'm going to kindly ask you to uh, turn off your cameras and unmute your microphones. And I will hand over the floor to my dear colleague Fabrizio, who will facilitate the uh, last session of the symposium. Uh, this symposium, this session will also look at the role of the agriculture, agricultural trade in 2050 and future multilateral trading system, but this time from the point of view of the farmers. So Fabrizio, the, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, uh, Cedric. Thank you, colleagues, for the very, very interesting discussion with a lot of references to the session. I have the honor and pleasure to um, introduce and uh, facilitate, as you said. Uh, so welcome, everyone, to uh, session seven of this year's uh, WTO Agriculture Symposium. This is the last session for the year. And uh, it is a session dedicated to uh, the voice of farmers and more precisely how farmers um, perceive the rules, uh, the multilateral rules enshrined by the WTO agreement on agriculture. And more importantly, how farmers would suggest that these rules could uh, and should change, evolve uh, and adapt to a rapidly changing world. So, um, Having said that, uh, the structure and the objectives for this session are uh, relatively simple. I will uh, just provide some context first. And uh, uh, the final objective for us is to um, single out a number of messages, the key messages from our distinguished uh, speakers uh, that uh, will be reflected in the report of this session as much as uh, all other messages from other sessions of the symposium uh, will be uh, reflected in the report of this year's symposium. And uh, with the objective uh, to send these messages to policymakers um, and, and the hope that this voice will be heard uh, in future uh, international cooperation on agricultural trade matters. And uh, the messages very importantly will also go uh, to next year's uh, UN Food System Summit, um, which will be uh, a very, very important um, occasion for discussing uh, uh, more extensively the matters related to agricultural trade and food system transformation. Um, now, um, regarding the, the context for our discussion with the uh, farmers' representatives, which I will uh, introduce uh, very shortly, uh, I am very pleased to say that, uh, as we heard in many sessions of the symposium, uh, agricultural trade patterns experience uh, constant and rapid shifts uh, driven, driven by various factors, by policy changes, by technology, uh, by external factors such as climate change, but also by uh, uh, a constellation of other uh, variables such as uh, environmental considerations, social considerations, uh, gender-related issues, uh, intergenerational equity concerns, uh, all the various elements uh, comprised under the broader sustainable development paradigm and umbrella. And uh, I have to say, um, quoting what uh, some of the previous speakers have said, that uh, if uh, this was a constellation of factors uh, at the beginning, at the birth of the WTO 25 years ago, and then at the entry to force of the WTO Agreement on Agriculture. Nowadays, uh, the constellation has probably become a galaxy because a, a variety of other elements have entered into the picture, uh, making such picture much more complex than it used to be uh, 25 years ago. Now, against that framework and against that scenario, trade uh, certainly plays an important role in ensuring that different parts of agri-food uh, systems and value chains are connected so that food and agricultural products can move from surplus to deficit areas and so that farmers uh, can also be enabled to understand the right signals from the markets and adjust uh, to those rapid shifts uh, in global conditions that I mentioned before. Now, the current multilateral rules governing agricultural trade uh, are set out by this WTO Agreement on Agriculture and uh, provide a framework uh, for the long-term reform of agricultural trade and domestic policies with the aim of uh, leading to fairer competition and less distorted agricultural production and trade patterns. The Agreement on Agriculture, uh, we wish to stress, is currently the only existing global accord that governs worldwide agricultural trade. That uh, legal instrument under the WTO legal framework is accompanied by other uh, agreements which are particularly relevant to the dis discussion on agricultural trade, such as the agreement on uh, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, 
and the agreement on technical barriers to trade. Now, given that international trade feeds one in every six people around the globe, it is particularly important uh, to monitor the implementation of the agreement on agriculture and even more to seek and improve uh, its disciplines, uh, which is certainly of key interest to the international community. And also, um, it is very important that the disciplines themselves remain relevant to a rapidly changing world. Um, on top of all the factors that shape uh, international agricultural trade and trade patterns and then cause those rapid shifts, uh, we have also experienced uh, uh, unprecedented external shocks such as uh, those generated by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic about which uh, WTO members have had uh, opportunities to exchange and to raise uh, significant concerns at the WTO uh, Committee on Agriculture. Um, members have raised a lot of concerns on response uh, measures um, to, to the recent pandemic, the ongoing pandemic. And these discussions have become very relevant and uh, thanks to um, the open and transparent mechanism set out by the uh, WTO Committee on Agriculture, uh, we could all have access to this discussion and, uh, and participate through the government representatives who have spoken at those meetings and keep on speaking at those meetings. So uh, this is a complex uh, framework, but is also a window of opportunity to contribute uh, to better rules uh, as I said at the outset, this is a brainstorming session, so it's a bit different uh, from the other session of the symposium because it gives a, a chance uh, to everyone to uh, go a bit beyond uh, the status quo and suggest uh, some forward-looking uh, improvements. And uh, without further ado then, uh, I'd like now to briefly introduce our very distinguished and knowledgeable uh, speakers for the session. And, uh, and then give them the floor by posing some questions to each of them. So today we have, to, we have with us Mr. Theo de Jagger, who is the president of the World Farmers Organization and is connected from South Africa. We have Shona Morris, vice president uh, for trade policy uh, for the National Milk Producers Federation of the United States and the Dairy, the Dairy Export Council who's connected from the US. We have uh, Alexis uh, Ugni, uh, a researcher in agronomy and economics uh, from the National Institute of Agricultural Economics um, of Benin, who's connect connected from Benin. And then last but not least, we have Raul Montemayor, national manager, manager of the Federation of Free Farmers and the Federation of Free Farmers Cooperatives of the Philippines connected from his country and to whom we send our special thanks because it's very late in the evening for uh, Raul. Uh, it, it was 10.30 p.m. when the session started. So uh, let us start our discussion uh, with the first round of question. And uh, I would like to start by posing a question to uh, Theo de Jagger of the World Farmers Organization. So Theo, uh, just to even set the scene a bit, uh, thanks to your experience. Please, uh, could you tell us how does international trade uh, have an impact on farmers? How useful is it to support farmers' daily efforts in terms of production, planning, and decision-making? So over to you, Theo, thanks. Thank you, Fabrizio, thank you for involving us as the farmer's voice in these this very important discussions too. You know, if, 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 if you would turn this issue around and look at it from the other side, from a food security side, we've moved into an era, and especially after COVID now, in which food security simply does not, no longer mean that any country consume everything it produces or produce everything it consumes. In the modern idiom, food security actually means that you need to produce enough of that in which you have a competitive advantage 
so that you can exchange from the food basket for that in which you do not have a, a, a competitive advantage. Because the world became an extremely small place for farmers. Every farmer is every day in competition with the best other farmers in the world. We produce enough food in the world. We waste around 35 to 40 percent of all the food we produce. The problem is that the food is not where the people are hungry and it usually costs too much to get it there. And trade, especially the accessibility of global markets have leveled out a lot of the tension that cause conflicts around food. In South Africa, where I farm in the valley where I farm, a mere 12 years ago, we produced around 35% of all the tea we consume in South Africa. Now we do not produce a single bag of tea, not because we are not good producers, because we cannot compete against Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, and Malawi and Kenya. The cost to produce a kilogram of tea is much higher in South Africa because of administered costs, the cost of labor, the cost of water, the cost of electricity. Hence, we now import all of those. But then we export much more subtropical fruits, grain, both wheat and maize and soya and even meat into those countries. So through trade between these countries, we have leveled out the balances in the food systems. For this reason, it's extremely important that farmers have access to the markets and even more important that they have access to the policy processes which control those markets. What we ask from the farmer side is, when there are arrangements around trade, when there's negotiations about trade, when we open up free trade zones, when there's a determination of special privileges in trade, special arrangement in trade, talk to the farmers too. We cannot bend the rules of supply and demand. It will always be king and we don't want to, but it is important for us who work in longer uh, uh, cycles of production to be able to adapt to the changes which is brought about by global trade. If we cannot produce something, even at the cost of another trade partner who can deliver it at your doorstep, then you either need to become more competitive or you need to change to another product in which you can be more competitive. But for us, we know the new name of the game is competitiveness in terms of standards and quality and price all over the globe, and you need to be fit. If you can't take the heat, you stay out of the kitchen. If you cannot produce in the first league, then you must adapt. It's adapt or die in, in, in that sense. And as long as we are part of the rulemaking and we take ownership of the rules, farmers know we must always up the, 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 the standards. The levels will always be higher. We will always have stronger and stronger forces to compete to. And it is not different to other sectors of the economy. It's only vital for a rural alternative to urbanization. As long as we can do good business across international boundaries, we can be able to secure food security as long as our lifetimes will last. We can for certain do something better when it comes to food loss and waste, but it is important that we maintain livelihoods, that we maintain profitable and sustainable in the business dimension of agricultural production on our farms. Because if farming is not a business, it's a welfare case and we have enough of those. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Theo, for, uh, for the intervention. 
um, it's interesting that you highlighted some uh, very basic and important concepts underpinning uh, um, the changes between uh, production uh, patterns uh, along countries which uh, relate to, as you said, uh, various sectors, not only agriculture, and the fact that uh, in the case of the interplay between farmers and the multilateral set of rules, there, should, there is a need for more, uh, um, for rules that accompany uh, better accompany the, the efforts of farmers to adapt to changes in comparative advantages and competitive advantages as well. Um, and it's important that you put the accent on the fact that uh, the world has become a small world nowadays. And uh, to that, I would also add that uh, it is important to note that uh, it's no longer uh, countries trading with each other, but these uh, products moving across highly integrated value chains, and that applies also to uh, agricultural products, uh, in particular when they are in their semi-processed or processed form, and so at their higher levels of value addition. Um, with that note, so thanks so much for uh, uh, helping out set the scene. Um, and now I would like to pass the floor to um, Shona Morris uh, with uh, another question that will bring us back again to the world, to the interplay between the world of farmers and uh, uh, the world of policymakers, which is at the core of our session. So Shona, uh, how would a real and sustainable liberalization of agricultural trade look like in your view? How could WTO members better address all the unwarranted barriers that affect market access for agricultural products. Over to you, Shona, thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, well, first I wanted to start with echoing the excellent point that Teo made earlier about making sure that farmers have a seat at the table in these discussions. And to that end, thank you to you and, and to the WTO for holding this session and, and having us all here today. Uh, I agree that that's a critical piece of it. Uh, the folks that we represent are directly impacted by all these policy decisions that ultimately get made. And I think that on balance, uh, farmers have been able to play a pretty active role, at, at least in my country, in a lot of the past trade discussions. Uh, I take that point a step further and encourage that I think it's important for some of the other multilateral organizations to make sure that they're including farmers at the table in the discussions, the food systems uh, debate for next year that was mentioned earlier, I think will be a, a key piece where that's gonna be especially relevant. Um, I wanted to take a minute or two to talk about the, the farmers that I work for uh, in the US. Uh, the National Milk Producers Federation represents the dairy farmers throughout the country and the Dairy Export Council is a primarily farmer funded organization, but also represents others throughout the supply chain uh, that was just referenced that are, are key to actually helping to facilitate the export of products to various markets. And our farmers have actually been going through relatively challenging times over the last several years. Uh, last year, for instance, we saw the biggest uh, year on year drop in, in dairy farm losses in the US than we've seen in 15 years. Uh, and over the last little bit longer than that, 17 years, we've lost half of our dairy farms. Uh, so uh, those that we have left, uh, we are keenly focused on what policy tools and measures are needed to be able to help them hang on to their family farms. 98% uh, of our farms in the US for dairy, as well as for most other ag sectors as well, are family owned, even if they're a little bit larger than some other countries. And for us, trade is an increasingly big piece of that. Uh, our farmers really have uh, kind of shifted their views over time in key part because of the advances made by the Uruguay round, uh, the disciplines, especially on export subsidies uh, that helped to level the playing field a lot more for other suppliers, including those from our country. And of course, the opening of doors on the tariff side of it that the Uruguay round ushered in. That really created a much more open landscape to be able to engage in the multilateral uh, trading system. Uh, and to be able to look at trade as a, a potential positive thing, uh, instead of, you know, historically and, and not too long before that, the implementation of that round's terms, uh, viewing trade as simply a bad thing that happens and something to which you have to react. Uh, so in, instead, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with some recommendations on how can we look forward and, and help to shape what's to come. Uh, I'd offer a couple key thoughts in that respect. Uh, and one is that 
uh, to actually drive forward to the next steps on sustainable uh, and deepening trade liberalization. That's something that needs to be pursued with input, with uh, commitments from all across the WTO membership. Uh, it's uh, unlike, in my view, I think the type of advances that were able to be made through the Nairobi commitment uh, that ultimately eliminated export subsidies. It's great, uh, and we fully supported that decision to make concrete progress on that one pillar of the key priority areas. But I think it's going to be a challenge to do that with respect to some of the other pillars that have historically been uh, quite core pieces of able to of agricultural liberalization, whether that's domestic subsidies or market access pieces. I think you really have to have those moving forward uh, with progress on both fronts as well as others perhaps, and progress from a range of WTO members across the spectrum, rather than looking to only uh, a subset of the membership to be able to carry the water forward on that. Uh, I'd also like to highlight, in my view, the importance of looking beyond just the tariff slice of it. Uh, increasingly, uh, what our industry and I think a lot of other ag sectors as well are dealing with is the heightened uh, prevalence of non-tariff barriers and the impact that those are having on trade, uh, sometimes in ways that are, are quite above and beyond the impact that the tariff has itself. Uh, the tariff is predictable. It stays at a certain level, typically. Uh, and in many cases, it's something that can be absorbed as a cost of doing business uh, if the right uh, market conditions exist. Non-tariff barriers in many cases, whether that's uh, labeling restrictions on the use of certain generic terms, uh, excessively onerous uh, uh, facility registration procedures, or unscientific import requirements that play themselves out in certification demands. I mean, all of these, I think, really contribute to grinding the gears of trade and need to be part of what's looked at in terms of the next advances uh, with respect to market access. Chris alone, I think, won't cut it to make progress. The final point I'd make is simply that uh, we need a way to see progress on those issues when there's violations happening in a much quicker path. Uh, we see you know, pretty consistent disregard, unfortunately, uh, for the codex and, and OIE standards that have been developed and can be very useful tools to help guide more open trade, I think. Uh, but challenging those through the existing dispute settlement process is such a lengthy ordeal that I think it ends up serving as a, a disincentive in practice for countries to comply. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shona, uh, for your uh, introductory contribution. Very interesting. In fact, you touched upon um, a number of uh, key points uh, also in relation to the current discussion negotiations in the WTO. I, uh, I've noted down the matter of export subsidies and the importance of the decision of uh, the Nairobi decision on the phasing out of export subsidies. And that it's uh, interesting to hear from you from the, from the real world that uh, this has had uh, important positive impacts uh, on, on your uh, daily operations. I think it's important to highlight that. And also looking forward, as you said, uh, in the narrative of the WTO, um, it's uh, already well known that uh, non-tariff measures, non-tariff barriers have uh, a great incidence on the ability of countries to integrate into international markets. Uh, you have mentioned some of those elements uh, that uh, certainly touch upon um, cross-cutting areas of the work of the WTO, but also go beyond uh, the doors of the WTO. And here I want to uh, echo some of my colleagues who have been uh, facilitating other sessions of the symposium, symposium who have said that uh, we should not forget that uh, uh, the WTO has a specific mandate uh, and uh, specific uh, typology of work, but uh, much of what will be achieved here uh, will also depend on discussions and work being carried out in a variety of other bodies, of other uh, cooperation frameworks. Like you mentioned some of them, some of the big standard making uh, bodies out there. Uh, there is a variety of these entities that play uh, a very important role. And last but not least, as you said, the importance of uh, having the whole membership on board uh, when it comes to discussing reforms. 
So thanks so much again for this uh, introductory contribution, very interesting. And now uh, I'd like to move on to uh, Dr. Alexis Ugni um, from Benin, who will uh, tell us something more uh, about some specific issues related uh, now to the situation of developing countries and LDCs in particular. So Alexis, the question I have for you is the following for now. How would you suggest that trade policy in general could better support food security goals? Over to you, Alexis. Thanks so much. Thank you, Fabrizio. Thank you, everybody. Food security is a complex phenomenon attributed to a range of factors that is very important across regions, countries social groups, and well as over time. That is a factor can groups in cluster representing the following four area of uh, potential vulnerability. The social, economic, and political, environmental, the performance of the food economies, care and feeding practices, care and sanitation. Food security exists when all people at uh, all time have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient salt and nutrition food to need that dietary need and food preference for an active and uh, healthy life. Favorability is determined by domestic production important capacity, existence of a food stock and food aid. For given set of underlying condition, a reform, it is case tried liberalization, change relative price to the exist than price and hence Incentive change this will elicit at position and the consumption response of a holder households. The reference determine the household food security results. Whether this result is net improvement of a determination and deterioration in an empiric question. The answer to which is dependent of the underlying condition. Underlying condition can be grouped in three categories: vacant functionality, labor characteristic, and endowment. Market fund functionality refers of the revaluing institutional and policy environment taking into account policy reform over than the tried reform on their way. It is all incorporates physical and technical infrastructure soon as transport and communication network. Labor characteristic in caps, human attribution, increase education, health standard, its openness in and the press uh, existing level of food security. Unmet are uh, household material attributes soon as natural resource, climate, remoteness, and the speciality and geographic proximity to border. The consumption response determine the food security result of the channel of Access, availability, and stability. A clear question concerning the access channel is what happened to household ability to buy food? This is affected by two indicators income and the price of food. That is a household able to produce and and a sufficient income to purchase the hold many are unable to grow the diversity. 
It is also true than some household laws in the process of tribe liberalization, leaving their food security compromise. Their domestic policy reform must accompany trade reform to enhance the positive effects of trade and to cushion any negative impact of the hungry. Trade influence there's food security dimension, direct and indirect through both general trade and agriculture trade in particular. For example, to the extent increase participation and integration in international trade forest economies ground, increase employment opportunity and improve it, the income earning capacity of the poor and the food insecurity is uh, its ancient access uh, to food. In addition, openness of agricultural tribe can promote food security by augmenting food supply to meet uh, some consumption needs and uh, reduce uh, the variety of viral food supply. Each level of trade openness is associated with a wide range of angry indicators. This angry this suggests that the impact of agricultural trade and trade liberalization on food security is limited by many other factors. Soon as the markets, infrastructure, institu institution, and the complementary policy environmental in which trade liberalization takes place. So, Mary, trade in itself is not a dire to now a panacea when I count to food security, but it is can pose challenge and even risk that need to be considered in policy decision marketing, trade policy instrument will include export restriction on certain products that contribute to food security, the elimination of imported tariff of agricultural production, the substance use of agricultural produce in life with the company three priority. Improving poverty, productivity, and increasing producer, producer revenue. Establishing production mechanism to stop small and large car producer. Taking small car producer into consideration, given that important affect the ability to be competitive. Outlining market information, technical assistance, infrastructure and marketing support policy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexis, for, uh, for your uh, introduction intervention. Uh, very interesting, uh, in my view, the fact that you uh, frame international trade in a much broader framework when it comes to uh, discussing uh, about food security. And uh, I think uh, also from what we heard at various other sessions of, uh, of the symposium, that's, it's really, really important to look at that uh, from a systemic point of view. So um, while not only uh, focusing on the uh, issue of export restrictions, for instance, of, um, or, or the accessibility uh, to determinate supplies while being very, very important. It's also um, perhaps in the context of a brainstorming exercise, important to look at uh, future disciplines from a more, from a broader systemic uh, point of view. Um, now, uh, going back to uh, how we would imagine 
a future legal framework under which uh, agricultural trade will, uh, uh, will, uh, will exist and hopefully will be facilitated in the future. Uh, I would like now to turn to uh, Raul Montemayor uh, with the following uh, question. So Raul, now with more specific reference to the design of uh, WTO disciplines on farm subsidies, which evolution would you consider useful to help countries achieve food security while not worsening poverty, distorting trade or harming the environment? So over to you, Raul, thanks. Thank you, Fabrizio. And uh, first of all, a uh, good day to everyone and a uh, happy birthday also, 25th birthday to the WTO. So as Fabrizio said, I come from the Philippines. It's a developing country. Uh, most of our farmers here are small scale farmers, one to two hectares each. Uh, we get visited by a lot of typhoons and calamities. Uh, we were not spared from COVID-19. Uh, so I would like to bring the perspective of small producers from developing countries into the discussion on domestic support. So first, uh, I'd like to point out that uh, we have to accept the fact that every government wants to help its farmers and we cannot fault them for doing that. It is, I think, both the right and obligation to help their farmers. The problem here, however, is that sometimes they resort to support measures that are trade distorting. And in the process, they end up harming farmers in other countries. And many of these farmers that are harmed are poor and small producers in developing countries. That is the basic problem. We have no question about the right of governments to support their farmers. But when they do that support and in the process they harm farmers in other countries, then we have a problem. And it does not, the, the, the harm does, is not limited just to the farmers. These farmers have families and when they become poorer because of the subsidies that harm them, then you also have rising hunger and malnutrition and a host of other social, political and other problems. And then even the environment is effective because if affected because when the farmer becomes desperate, uh, again, because of some trade distorting subsidies, they resort to unsustainable farming practices to, sur to survive. Even food security of countries like the Philippines could be compromised if the imports are too excessive that they displace local production to such an extent that we become overly dependent on external supply of food. So I think when we talk about domestic subsidies, we have to find a way where we can sort of balance these two sides of a double-edged sword. We protect our farmers, we give them the support that they need, but we make sure that we do not harm farmers in other parts of the world. The Gut Uruguay Round approach was to flag what they call trade distorting support measures. They limited the, the, the amount that you could give in terms of trade distorting measures. And also they paved the way for the reduction of these measures. And I think this was, this was a sizable first step because it put the cap on, on, on these types of trade distorting measures. But we all know that uh, despite this good first step, there are still major imbalances that remain. Uh, countries who were able to support their farmers in the past through a lot of these subsidies were able to retain a lot of their subsidies. And then countries like the Philippines, for example, who had very little resources to do that in the past, we are limited to our 10% de minimis in terms of support. And just to give you a perspective, <clears throat> that the whole budget of our Department of Agriculture, our, our uh, uh, agency that supports agriculture comes out to about $1.6 billion in one year. And this is very small compared to the subsidies that some governments give to their farmers, which run into sometimes uh, 50, 60, 70 billion dollars in one year. So imagine the whole budget of one government for all of its farmers, and we have about 10 million farmers here. It's just a small portion of the subsidies that farmers get uh, from their governments uh, through these uh, support measures. So 
So I think we need to do something about it. Uh, of course, we can try to impose more limits and restrictions on domestic support as we did in the agriculture, but there will always be resistance to that. And I think the dispute settlement process in the WTO has not been really successful in preventing uh, uh, the, the, the abuse of the rules or the, the disobedience to the rules because of the protect, protracted way in which disputes are settled. So my main point is that if countries continue to distort markets through their subsidies, we now have to allow the countries who are harmed by these subsidies to fully protect themselves. So that is, I think, only fair. And now with the ex expiry of the peace clause, both domestic and export subsidies are now actionable. We can challenge them through the dispute settlement process. But for countries like us, we do not have the money to hire expensive lawyers in Geneva nor do we have the time to go through this long dispute settlement process. I think now we have more options to use the trade remedies like countervailing, anti-dumping, and even safeguard measures uh, that can more promptly address market disturbances that are brought about by the subsidies. In a way, countries can subsidize their producers all they want, but they must now pay the price for it. So I believe that WTO members must now be more serious and resolute in the future <clears throat> in reducing the trade distortion subsidies in whatever form. They should be stricter in disciplining those who do not follow the rules. And we should now be more open to, to providing uh, countries affected by these subsidies with the legal tools and the basis for protecting themselves against the, harm, against the harmful effects of domestic trade distorting subsidies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Raul. You uh, provided a very clear picture uh, of, uh, of the situation uh, from your perspective and uh, how uh, you perceive uh, the interaction between uh, your world and the current multilateral uh, framework of rules. Um, now, I, 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 I have noted down some, some points from what you said, like, for instance, the need for governments uh, to help farmers. And uh, I think this uh, was also uh, a message that was um, highlighted in other sessions. And the fact that, uh, objectively speaking, uh, farmers cannot be left to themselves, there, there must be some form of support. Now, the issue here, the very, the very difficult issue is to find out, as you said, uh, what kind of support uh, could be considered as uh, genuine, genuinely supporting uh, farmers' efforts to, uh, to grow and integrate sustainably into international markets, and what kind of support then leads uh, to distortions that then in turn harm farmers in other countries. Um, I, I'd like to, uh, you have made a lot of references to dispute settlement and that's a very interesting uh, discussion, but uh, I would suggest also for, uh, in general, for our interventions in this brainstorming session on future rules uh, is uh, to imagine us a bit more as policy makers or as rule, rules makers for the future, and perhaps also think of uh, disciplines that currently do not exist in the legal framework and that perhaps uh, would help us uh, in the future uh, to avoid uh, disputes and, uh, and unilateral reactions to measures implemented in other countries. So uh, perhaps measures uh, that could be thought of for future rules, uh, well integrated uh, into uh, um, an improved agreement on agriculture or also in other uh, international legal uh, agreements that would help, for instance, farmers in their uh, adaptation efforts to uh, climate change, uh, that would focus perhaps on helping with the technological uptake uh, that is necessary uh, when it comes to uh, 
um, new agricultural practices or uh, the, the technological improvements that interest the world of agricultural production nowadays. Um, and also last but not least also mechanisms on technical assistance also that could be integrated uh, in a new set of rules. And uh, there is some precedent uh, in the WTO legal framework also on uh, um, technical assistance mechanisms uh, which uh, are based on new uh, triggers and uh, been included uh, in uh, new WTO agreements like the trade facilitation agreement, for instance. So by analogy, one could also think of uh, broadening the discussion for new rules also to beyond uh, certain frontiers uh, that, we, that didn't exist uh, uh, 25 years ago. With that, I thank you again for this uh, first intervention, very interesting. And very briefly, I would like to ask uh, to all of you if anyone would like to briefly react uh, to uh, these first statements made by uh, our fellow uh, panelists. No, doesn't seem so. So we can move on to uh, the second round of uh, questions uh, for our session. So let's start now with a different order uh, of interventions. I would like to start now with uh, Alexis um, from Benin. So Alexis, uh, I have another question here for you. Uh, now with specific reference to the case of cotton, which has also been mentioned in the, in the previous session as a very important chapter for uh, WTO work and WTO agricultural negotiations at present. So talking about cotton, and cotton value chains in Africa. Could you please explain the role of such value chains for the achievement of socioeconomic promotion and environmental protection objectives? And also identify which support measures could be enacted at the multilateral level to benefit to the benefit of small cotton farmers and processors. Over to you, Alexis. Thank you. Thank you. It is important to understand that cotton is a multi products. Many people are unaware that cotton by products are used in products for women consumption soon as refining oil and butter and animal feed. There is major potential of the local processing of these products. Moreover, the textile, clothes, and fashion sector have a significant capacity to create jobs and wealth because the country has a competitive advantage in this area. Let's take the example of the crash machine sector. In this sector, will there is a generated through the reuse cotton stake in particle board, the processing plant requis, a cotton stake collect emitted, the transporters, technicians, and workers responsible of inter factor processing, the traders. Workers able to produce wood, furniture, table, and so on. Turning to cotton seed value chain, seed obtained by ginning are under reuse at seed or utilized in oil meal when the oil is extracted for human consumption. The cotton seed meal remaining after extraction is proceeding in cakes, which is used for humanal, criminal animal seed. Cotton seed caca also have other agricultural use, soon in fertilizer or culture substance or for much more food. Wet is general whenever cotton is processed, reuse of value is 
ADN. Moreover, soon activity require a workforce, meaning that job and the prison and socio economies goal film. It is all possible to return part of the processing, processing residue to learn the implement fertilization layer. Not only those, this contributes to the stability of the grain economies, but it also ensures protection of the environment. Promotional measure. The textile and uh, crossing industry is somewhat happened by the weakness in local processing. It is vital that the necessary production and technological input are put in place so that we can prevent the process of cotton and the competitive on the textile production market. Such inputs increase energy faster in forest formats. As you are now, we do not have enough energy to supply households. Let alone small and, um, and uh, median entrepreneurs or uh, industry. The cost of uh, energy is factor than hinder the development of cotton processing sector. Other crucial factor are technology and the ability to compare since it is not only a question of processing for the sake of processing. Instead, we must be able to sell and be present of the market, which have now opened up taking take to regional and international trade agreements signed by the country. However, access to cotton and technology in the textile sector is very limited because the cost of protecting equipment is high. Stakeholders in the fashion and apparel sector and design requires capacity building so that they are able to meet international standard and produce on large scale. This will lead to the industrialization of small scale entreprises in the clothing apparel sector and will enhance their competitiveness, thereby enabling them to access international marketing in which they have comparative advantage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexis. Uh, once again, a very interesting uh, intervention of August from Cotton. I, I should have said at the beginning that I, I, um, I have the honor of working for the Cotton section of the Agriculture and Commodities Division of the WTO. So uh, the subject of Cotton is uh, particularly dear uh, for me and a uh, matter of my day-to-day -day work. Uh, it's interesting to hear uh, the case of cotton because cotton is such a special agricultural product, no? which uh, is an agricultural product with uh, the value chain of an industrial product. Uh, and that's so many different ramifications. So you have placed the accent on the, on the potential for value addition of cotton byproducts, which is uh, very interesting and uh, yeah, to mention, but also in the promotional measures uh, that you have proposed, um, for uh, the multilateral uh, trading system to uptake and try to uh, improve the, the, the situation in the market. Um, you have mentioned in particular technology uh, to improve the ability to compete, which I think brings back a bit to what uh, uh, Theo de Jagger said at the beginning, um, 
which is, but from a different perspective. So Theo was mentioning that uh, uh, markets are integrated and it's normal that there are, there are shifts in production driven by um, changes in comparative advantages and competitive advantages. Um, now, Theo also mentioned the fact that uh, the, the rules of the game uh, need to be clear and then the playing field need to be fair for uh, those comparative advantages uh, to be driven by uh, market-based uh, considerations instead of other factors affecting the comparative advantage of, uh, of producers across different countries. You, Alexis, have put in the perspective uh, of technologies uh, to enable uh, farmers to compete, uh, which is a very, very important subject uh, and also something that was stressed uh, once again in the session that preceded our session. Uh, I have noted down during that session some of the points uh, regarding uh, communication technologies that were mentioned that, and also it would be interesting uh, how, to know how uh, those technological improvements uh, ring a bell, if any, into the ears of farmers. Uh, issues such as access the technologies to facilitate the access to market price information, uh, technologies for precision agriculture uh, to reduce the cost of inputs at the farm level, um, and ultimately also technologies to create the condition to draw value, hidden value from environmental services, which are managed by farmers uh, for free uh, most of the time, but uh, for which we know that there is a hidden value that uh, should be uh, possibly highlighted, um, depending, in fact, on the preferences of multilateral uh, cooperation when it comes to uh, future rules. So thanks again, Alexis, for, uh, for this intervention. And uh, on those notes, uh, I'd like to uh, go back to uh, Shona and uh, ask Shona, uh, about uh, what principles, uh, in your view, uh, should guide market access for agricultural products and how such princip principles could be better reflected in, in the international trade rule book. So over to you, Shona. Thanks. Thank you. Um, well, I guess I'd, I'd offer three ideas or, or thoughts uh, in that space. Uh, and the first uh, builds a little bit off of a point I made earlier, which is the importance of, of disciplines being implemented across the WTO membership. Uh, but I'd also add, not just across the, the membership of countries, but I think it's really important that a principle be that, there are, that this is inclusive across product sectors as well. Because that's one of the really key things that the WTO and the multilateral system can offer in terms of leaps forward is a, a general uh, strides forward toward a bit more level global playing field by tackling with measures and, and tariff levels from a multitude of different countries at once. Uh, in contrast to the, the really snapshot and, and isolated progress that can be made in a bilateral agreement or even a regional agreement. If you don't have all of the major parties at the table, both from the exporter side and the importer side, it's hard to make the same level of progress. And so exempting any product sectors from that, I think becomes quite difficult uh, and problematic. Uh, secondly, I'd say would be to, to figure out how to more fully uh, incorporate and accounting for the non-tariff elements that play such a big role in the market access piece of it. I think a, a market access approach that is has blinders on effectively and only looks at the tariff pieces is missing a big component of what is actually influencing openness of markets and, and real world market access flows. Uh, so figuring out how to quantify that and incorporate that into the discussions, particularly if we're able to identify some kind of systematic non-tariff measures that are of concern across a number of different countries that, you know, you can't chase everything, but if there's a, a type of common practice uh, that's being employed by a number of different members, then, then trying to address that and, and factor that in, I think could be extremely helpful as well. Uh, and then the third point I'd offer would be uh, to, to find a way of, of reinforcing the existing commitment uh, to be pursuing the least trade distorting uh, measures possible to achieve the objectives. I, I think that 
a lot of the trade challenges we deal with in the market access space seem to stem from that not being adhered to uh, by all of the WTO members. You know, nobody's got clean hands here. Um, but whereas, but I think that impacts in particular uh, those that are looking on export markets as a key part of what helps to, to support the farmers. Uh, you know, as Raul mentioned earlier, I think, you know, there's measures that are WTO authorized and, and available to countries to help deal with problems they view as import issues that, that are, are, you know, in their view, not being in keeping with what, what others' obligations are. The dispute settlement system, I, I apologize for Brizio for coming back to that, but, but that's really the only avenue that exporters have to seek redress for problems. And so until that's fixed or until we have a new policy uh, devised to be able to, to come up with another way of more speedily and at a lower cost way addressing those problems that impact export flows, I think that will continue to be a very sore spot area uh, because I don't see a way forward aside from that. Thank you. Thank you, Shona. You don't have to be sorry to go back to, uh, to the dispute settlement, <laughs> because I think, uh, I mean, as, as everyone knows, that's a jewel in the, in the crown of the WTO and the fact that uh, uh, having uh, such a, an effective enforcement mechanism has helped a lot uh, over the last 25 years uh, to, um, to inject uh, certainty and predictability into the system. So uh, that's a fact uh, as we look backwards. And uh, that's also a fact, uh, probably, as we, as we look forward. Uh, it was just suggesting before that, uh, you know, that we are brainstorming about what could happen from now until 2050 and uh, how new rules would, um, uh, would be adapted to, uh, to, the, to a changing world. Then it, it would have been the case to, to concentrate also uh, on the framing of new possible rules. Uh, but that's exactly uh, what you are offering here. So uh, it's, it's perfect. And uh, also, I mean, uh, your notes about uh, the value addition coming from uh, multilateral reforms uh, are really, really encouraging to be heard from, uh, from the voice uh, of, the, of the farmers you represent, uh, because uh, I personally have learned at school that the WTO uh, system is a public good uh, that is accessible to all and is non-rival in consumption and uh, is a system that is open and transparent and allows for something to be done perhaps uh, uh, at a lower pace or a more, more difficult pace, but at the same time uh, for everyone. So uh, it's interesting that you uh, made that note about uh, the value addition of going through the multilateral route. Um, and also the fact uh, of considering uh, uh, reforms across a variety of products uh, rather than focusing on, on specific cases, uh, which, uh, which is also very interesting from a systemic point of view. Um, those messages uh, have been retained. And again, thanks so much for that. Now, um, I would like to uh, move back to uh, Raul, Raul Montemayor with another question in the second round. So uh, it's essentially the same point we have discussed with, uh, with Shona uh, about market access and, uh, and future rules. Uh, but now with a view to addressing the concerns of farmers in developing countries uh, and particularly from a sustainable development point of view. So keeping the sustainability with all its uh, multifaceted uh, dimensions in the back of our mind and the point of view of farmers in developing countries. So over to you, Raul. Thanks so much. Okay. Uh, thank you again, Fabrizio. Uh, and I'm very happy that this issue is being uh, tackled in our in our session, because oftentimes we just hear about uh, trade growth, how much gro uh, trade has grown. But you know, if there are no farmers who produce products, there will be no trade. So we have to take care of the farmers, otherwise many people will get out of uh, business. So it's, I think it's a very important that we focus at this point on, on what has happened to, to farmers, especially uh, small producers in developing countries. And they, they, there are many of them. Uh, 
IFAD estimated in 2015 that there are 500 million small farms in the world involving 2 billion people. That's almost uh, one fourth of the world's population. And within that sector, 80% are poor, either extremely or moderately poor in, in, in that sector. So you have uh, a lot of people involved in agriculture and that, that is also where a lot of the poor people uh, depend for their livelihood. Even the poverty that we see in the cities, the slums and the congestion, et cetera, it's deeply rooted in the poverty in the rural areas because uh, most of the people who migrate to the cities are, are people who, who are searching for a better life. They, they went out of the rural areas because they could not earn a decent living from the farming. So if we really are serious about using trade to reduce poverty and malnutrition and the, the sustainable development goals, we have to make sure that an equitable portion of trade or the benefits of trade actually, actually go to these small and vulnerable, vulnerable farmers. We have to find a way to make trade work for the poor. And we ask the question now, uh, has, has trade benefited small producers? On, on, in, in one sense, I think, but maybe also in a perverse way, yes, it has benefited producers because they would have been worse off in the absence of trade rules, given the imbalances in the levels of support and protection among countries. So yes, and, and there have been cases, uh, success stories where countries have been able to expand their exports and their farmers also have benefited from this expansion in exports. But the main point I'd like to stress here is that in general, I think most of the benefits of increased trade have not gone to small producers or to farmers. They have been captured by multinational companies or large companies at a global scale and by market intermediaries in the domestic level. That is where most of the profits have gone because uh, we can say trade has grown, uh, countries' exports have grown, uh, but it, it is not countries who trade, it is traders who trade, whether they are multinational companies or local traders. And, and uh, the, the data from the, 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 the WTO provided us uh, seems to show that trade is still dominated by a few developing, developed countries. And in fact, there were more countries with trade deficits in 2019 than in 2015. Okay. So meaning uh, not necessarily bad, I think, but it, it points to some uh, impression that uh, a lot of the less developed countries have not been able to take advantage of increased market access through exports. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, last year, we were, we were actually the last country with quantitative restrictions. Uh, we had it on rice for more than 20 years. Uh, and last year, we decided to, to remove the quantity, quantitative restrictions and replace them with tariffs. And uh, the, the rationale was uh, it would allow our consumers to buy, to, to access cheaper rice from foreign suppliers. Okay, that was the whole context of our tarification process. But what happened <clears throat> when the market was opened up to imports, there was a flood of cheap imports into the market. Uh, they, all, they always go through the wholesale market. So the immediate impact was a drop in the farm gate prices that local farmers received for their paddy. So there was a big drop there. And we noticed that although the wholesale prices went down because of the imports, the, re the retail price, the price that consumers were paying for the rice did not move at very much. It basically remained at the same level that it was uh, when the quantitative restrictions were still in place. So where did the money go? It went, it went to wholesalers, it went to retailers, it went to importers. 
they pocketed most of the gains from trade. And I think that is a reality in a lot of countries, in developing countries, that while uh, trade rules at the global level may not exactly be responsible for, but when we craft these rules, we have to take cognizance of this fact that, not, that the small producers are not getting an equitable share of the benefits from trade. The second point is we have to recognize that in developing countries, uh, small producers have very limited capacities to respond to market signals. You give them the right signal, you can tell them the price of, uh, let's say rice is very high in this country, but that, that's all there is to it. They have no capacity to bring the rice to that market in the volume, in the timing, in the packaging and quality that is required by the market. And this has been exacerbated now by the increase in non-trade barriers, as Sean said. Uh, it, it makes it even harder for ordinary farmers to comply with this standard. So, so what should we do? How can we uh, adjust the trade rules so that producers can get a more equitable price of the pie, uh, equitable piece of the pie? Well, I think the trade distorting issue has a lot to do with it. We have to put a lid on that. I think allowing countries to protect themselves through safeguards, through countervailing measures. At the moment, it will be more effective than putting caps on subsidies uh, because that will really hurt those who distort markets. And then uh, related to this is tariff, uh, this issue of tariff escalation because if we do not allow uh, developing countries, farmers in developing countries to uh, sell value added products, then they will just be relegated to suppliers of cheap raw materials no? and they will not be able to benefit again uh, equitably. But to be fair, uh, as I said, this is not the fault of the WTO. Uh, this is mainly the role and responsibility of national governments. They have to do their homework. They have to make sure that local markets are functioning properly, that there is true competition and that anti-competitive behavior is prevented. They have to provide the marketing infrastructure so that farmers in remote areas can actually respond to price and market signals. And then they have to provide the support in terms of credit, irrigation, technology, et cetera, so that farmers uh, can produce good quality products that are competitive in the market. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Raul. Uh, really, really interesting uh, intervention. Uh, you have mentioned some data, um, and I was while you were uh, speaking, I was also looking at our uh, background note uh, on agriculture uh, trade uh, produced in, con in conjunction with this uh, edition of the Ag Symposium. Uh, I, I, I was looking at a couple of cases, uh, soybeans, rice, and I'm not really sure that I have the same reading as you have uh, as to the shifts uh, in terms of top top traders from uh, from 95 until 2019. But uh, we leave it uh, to uh, to our uh, viewers and, uh, and and audience, you know, to have a look at the statistics, which uh, which is always very interesting. Uh, apart from that, um, it's really really interesting. Uh, the fact that we are talking about trade and trade impacts, uh, if, if trade can benefit uh, small and vulnerable producers. And um, I think in general that uh, there is a, a tendency, you know, to, uh, to look at trade as the, as the key point, uh, bringing together all the various dots of the galaxy uh, I mentioned at the beginning. Um, whereas uh, it, it should not be forgotten that uh, trade is a, is a beautiful means to connect all those dots, but in and of itself, uh, it can't really uh, respond 
to certain very important needs from the various actors along the value chains. Uh, and as you said correctly, uh, there are so many other uh, parts that have to play a role. So you mentioned the, the role of national governments, for instance, uh, in safeguarding uh, fair competition at the local level. Um, and you mentioned uh, the importance of promoting value addition and uh, the fact that benefit sharing along the value chains should start uh, from a fairer national legal framework that protects uh, the producers already at the, at the national level. So uh, I think it's really, really uh, interesting the picture again that you offered and very comprehensive uh, in terms of touching upon all the various parties that had to play a role. But certainly uh, at the end of the day, trade as both uh, the curse and the blessing of uh, connecting the dots and so being at the same time uh, uh, the element that can be picked up uh, as something that uh, brings everything together, but uh, the element that very easily uh, ends up being uh, blamed uh, when something is not, uh, is not working. So um, I, I, I thank you again for that. And I now move back to uh, Teo de Jagger uh, with another question. So Teo, what policy adjustments could assist farmers to better reap the benefits of international trade at the multilateral and bilateral level, in your view? Over to you, Teo, thanks. Thank you. Uh, international and domestic policy coherence is the key to enable farmers to truly benefit from trade. You see, it's a great equalizer. It, it brings level playing fields and it brings certainty. And policy certainty is one of the foundations of meaningful investment in the primary production sector. And how do you, we bring about that policy coherent, co, um, coherence? Well, first of all, by re revitalizing the World Trade Organization. This is extremely important that we, we set up these multilateral negotiations leading to a comprehensive trade agreement because it's simply the best way to pursue, to pursue food and nutrition security. We, we need to give the WTO more teeth and we need to give it more power to gravitate the, the decision makers towards the middle ground. We need sustainability and especially sustainability of food systems to be a very clear goal of international trade. See the given the the increasing urgency of promoting sustainability as an overarching policy objective. And if the global community is channeling efforts towards shifting to sustainable food systems, this trade policy framework must be a very clear part of it. Then we, we need more consultation with farmers organizations. Once there was, once we have an agreement against governments or even against um, multilateral structures, the African Union and the European Union, it is not to say that we have covered the viability, the sustainability and the profitability of the farmers on a grassroots level, because we do not all over the world necessarily have a good connection between national policies and what's happening on the ground. And, and, and trade is a very good example of it. I read recently uh, an, an article about the levels of trade on food and fiber in Africa, which estimated it to be less than 3% in Africa. Africans trade with each other in terms of food and fiber as less than 10, uh, than 3% of the global trade in Africa. We, we have not even 
utilized our own African market as yet. But then, you move towards any of the bigger borders in, in Africa, it leaked like meshes. Actually, people and money and goods are flowing to and th throw through these borders as if they don't exist. It's very difficult to measure exactly what the, 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 the trade numbers are. And the big reason for it is this disconnectiveness. It is not possible to control in Africa as it is, for example, in Europe. Then other actions which one could do is, of course, strengthen international standards. Make sure that they apply all over. But to strengthen international standards, you, you, you also need to build capacity. You must empower farmers to meet those standards. Standards in Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America is a bit different to standards in Europe, the USA, Canada. For this reason, it is, it's very important that we woo governments towards other agreements which is not necessarily trade related, but which forms the foundation of trade, such as investment agreements, property rights agreements, also plant breeders rights and intellectual property agreements. And then we must reduce protectionist measures. Our farmers have so many times called on governments to remove measures which are inconsistent with the WTA disciplines, including both export and import prohibitions or restrictions. And then we must increase the transparency and the predictability of agricultural markets. And we must ensure that farmers benefit fairly from the opening of new markets. Now, Raul did touch on to this. And, you know, actually, I, I would love to package what he said on this, um, you know, kind of a voice message and send it out to farmers all over the world. Because under COVID, we saw something about the danger of centralization in our value chains. Very often we think, and we read in the media, that new trade agreements opened up new markets for countries. But the only ones who benefit are two or three major corporations, multinational corporations, because they have the capacity to utilize those opportunities. And very little of that opportunity um, drips down to grassroots level, where you have a family trying to eke out a living from the soils. If a fairy would land on my shoulder and give me one wish for the transformation of global trade policies, I would wish for a dispensation where the smallest and the most vulnerable can utilize their entrepreneurial skills to access market opportunities elsewhere in the world across their, 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 their own borders. This is the only real way we can address the toughest issue of our time, which is poverty and hunger. If we can give those opportunities down to the broadest possible basis, and agriculture lends itself to that. No other sector of the global economy is as diversified and yeah, stands on a broader basis than agriculture. I think was it Roy, Raul also who said, we, we have some 2 billion small entrepreneurs, small business people addressing the core issue of poverty. You can only destroy poverty in one way by creating wealth and agriculture does that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Theo, it's really uh, fantastic and comprehensive answer. Uh, you have touched upon uh, so many uh, subjects that we would need another session to uh, unpack uh, or repack all that you've been uh, saying. 
but uh, we'll have a chance at the end of the session, which is approaching to uh, wrap up. Um, I've been told that we have five more minutes uh, beyond the, the end uh, scheduled end of the session. So that allows us a bit to uh, perhaps address uh, another question from the audience and also allows uh, each of you uh, to condense the key messages you want to pass uh, at the end of the session um, so as to conclude. Uh, and then I will uh, take care of transitioning to the, to the next and final uh, um, session of the symposium. Uh, so regarding uh, uh, the question from, uh, from the audience, we have received a very interesting question submitted so kindly by the government of New Zealand. And uh, the question is the following. Now I will read that and uh, I will ask you just to raise your hand if any one of you would like to react to that question. So the question is the following, and they read it verbatim. How should government support best agricultural practice with regards to tackling some of the very real and threatening global challenges of today, such as climate change and achieving our sustainable development goals without undermining WTO obligations and rules? So this echoes a bit some uh, of the arguments we have been uh, discussing already, but uh, I was wondering whether any one of you would like to, uh, to react to this. Okay, we'll go to Shona first, followed by Raul. So Shona, over to you, thanks. Sure, uh, I think just very briefly, I think support for some of the new technologies, uh, that adoption of those could help to deal with uh, climate change issues could be really useful for farmers in a variety of sectors. Uh, secondly, though, I think it's really important that governments approach this from the lens that there's no one size fits all answer. Um, certainly what works in one country may not work in another. And, and I do worry that we're on the risk of uh, seeing a, a potential proliferation if governments had the wrong way on how to deal with this issue of even more uh, barriers to trade being erected in the name of sustainability or, or climate change measures by trying to impose, again, one size fits all solution on, on everyone else as well. So I just offer that shortly. Thank you so much, much appreciated. Now over to you, Raul, for a quick yes, reaction. Uh, yes, first, uh, well, especially for small farmers, we, I think we should focus on giving incentives to farmers uh, who adopt good agricultural processes, practices instead of focusing on penalties. So, uh, and then second, we have to develop technologies that are both environmentally uh, beneficial, but at the same time, and more important, beneficial to the farmers. Uh, for example, uh, just a brief example, when we were teaching farmers how to do composting and fermentation so that they can produce their own fertilizers, we did not sell it as an environmentally helpful product. We sold it as a, as a technology that will reduce the costs of farmers instead of buying fertilizer from the market. So that, that is more appealing, I think, to farmers. Uh, and then in, in our country, one of the big problems now with either organic agriculture, or even good agricultural processes, is the high cost of certification. And I think governments have to help farmers both get the certification and comply with the standards. Thank you very much, uh, Raul. Uh, if no one else would like to uh, intervene, we have just five minutes uh, to conclude. And uh, with those five minutes, I would like to, uh, uh, to ask each of you uh, to um, condense your key messages uh, with one minute uh, for each of you maximum. Uh, so we take over the original order of intervention. So we start with uh, uh, Teo for a quick uh, wrap up of your uh, key messages. Please, Teo, over to you. Thank you. Um, I, did, I did not have enough time to answer some of the questions which were posted to me on questions and answers. Uh, Hilton asked me uh, about the role of food aid both on the, the supply and the demand side 
And I think um, this is one of the themes that needs much more unpacking. Very often it can happen that food A disrupts markets for farmers. You do more damage to the community you, you try to help through food aid than what, 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 what you really assist. Uh, of course, buying by food aid agencies of farmers products, um, it, it reduces the supply while the demand stays the same and we see the increasing of prices, but the opposite can also happen when, when, when you dump uh, stuff onto the market and, and local producers no longer have uh, a proper price for, for their stuff. But in total, we must accept that in the next 10 years, we will probably see um, much more growth in global trade in food and fiber products than what we have seen in the last 10 years. And the pressure will increase on both policymakers and on producers and traders to iron out the kind of rules which is fair and just to all. And the one other issue which I, I want us to flag for a future discussion is of course the issue of trade conflict and trade wars of um, uh, um, embargoes and sanctions. Every time I go to Russia, the Russian farmers leaders want to know from me, what does the European say about the embargo and they, do they also feel the pain? Does it disrupt them as much as it does disrupt them as, as Russians? And then when I go back to Berlin, the first thing the media wants to know from, from me, what does the Russian say about this embargo? Do they also feel the pain and, and, and can't we bring this thing to a stop? Now, of course, we have members both in Russia and in Europe, so I, we, we cannot take sides. But I always say to them, I so wish that governments would stop knocking each other on the head with our produce every time they pick up a scrap that has got nothing to do with us. We must not use food as weapons in trade against each other. There should be a global rule with high penalties if politicians use food because it has a limited shelf life. Thank you very much, uh, Theo. Message very clear. Now over to you, uh, Shona, for a very quick uh, wrap up. Uh, we really are running out of time, so I call on your cooperation. But 30 seconds for each of you. Thanks so much. Sure. Two quick points then. Uh, first, uh, appreciated Theo's earlier comments on the importance of international standards. Uh, I, I talked about them a little bit too. I think it is critical to ensure that they are used uh, to help ensure food safety, uh, and particularly with respect to the interests of, of suppliers from developing countries, but my own farmers as well, uh, that they're not being intentionally set in order to raise a bar that others can't meet in ways that aren't needed uh, to achieve those food safety outcomes. And then I'd hammer home the, the piece on, on non-tariff measures and really the need to develop a better, more rapidly working approach uh, to, to curbing those, the dispute settlement system that I've mentioned isn't doing that. Uh, and that's a chief problem. Perhaps that needs improvements or perhaps we need a different policy measure, but, but that really needs to be disciplined in a much more effective way than we've been able to today. Thank you very much. Now uh, over to Alexis for uh, 30 seconds. Thank you, Alexis. Your mic is muted. Excuse me. Today, the COVID-19 crisis suggests a change in behavior and even struggling to keep uh, the trick seek and balance, reduce accessibility, stability of supply. See you. That is a very, the only guarantee for reducing the vulnerability of household. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yet another reference to COVID and uh, its impact on future rules. Uh, you're, many of you have made that point. Uh, now let's close with uh, uh, 30 seconds for uh, Raul to share uh, with us his wrap up. And then I, I will officially close the session and uh, transition to the next one. Thanks. Yes, so uh, happy birthday again to the WTO. Uh, I know there, there is some frustration that the negotiations are still at an impasse but we should be proud of what the WTO has achieved in the past 25 years. So in the next 25 years, I hope we can also focus on 
improving the trading system, making it not only freer, but also fairer, and making sure that everybody benefits from trade equitably. Thank you. Thanks, Raul, for that uh, beautiful and encouraging uh, message for, uh, for the near future. Um, now, I would like to officially close the session by uh, thanking all of you, our distinguished panelists, who have so uh, passionately and uh, accurately shared their thoughts and knowledge with us today. Uh, thanks to our viewers. And uh, I think it's, it's clear uh, from what we have heard today that the farmers of the world represented uh, by you call for more action on the side of policymakers to improve the existing multilateral rules governing agricultural trade. And I also think it's clear that, multi that the multilateral trading system is extremely relevant to the life of farmers, small and big. We have heard of the impacts of certain policies on the daily operation of farmers, on their decision-making processes, on their marketing strategies. Now this session has confirmed the existence of a strong and concrete link between the world of international policy making and the real world of farmers. Um, and now on those notes, while thanking you all once again, I would like to pass the floor to my director, Mr. Edwini uh, Cassi, uh, the director of the Agriculture and Commodity Divisions Division of the WTO to make some concluding remarks on this year virtual agriculture symposium. Thank you so much. Over to you, Edwini. And thank you very much, Fabrizio. Uh, we have now come to an end to the 2020 virtual edition of the WTO Agriculture Symposium. This has not been the first and will certainly not be the last of our dialogues on, agricult on the agricultural sector and trade. Our dialogues have been very useful as they have enabled us to discuss in a positive atmosphere the trends and challenges facing the agricultural sector, which is vital not only for trade, but the very survival of human life. I'm sure you will agree with me that our knowledge of agricultural issues, the challenges, prospects, and linkages with other topics has been enhanced by this two-day discussion. Over the course of this period, we have participated in webinars that covered a range of products running the gamut of food security to food safety, nutrition, environmental sustainability, and the impact of COVID-19 on the agricultural sector and trade. In addition, in two sessions towards the end of the symposium, trade policy experts brainstormed on potential future looking disciplines in agriculture, and farmers teamed up with the WTO to tell us firsthand about the experiences with the Agreement on Agriculture, the session um, of the last panel. We are grateful to all the speakers who have joined us all over for the world, across different time zones to make this symposium possible. We have sp speakers logging in from Africa, the Americas, Asia and Oceania, for some of them in the early hours of the morning. The same applies to viewers who joined us from government, the private sector, civil society, from all corners of our planet. Above all, what this level of engagement reflects is that there are very important conversations to be had on international trade in food and agriculture. Discussions that are vital, not only for the fulfillment of WTO's mission, but also critical for the realization of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The United Nations Secretary General has fixed an important rendezvous for the discussion next year on food systems through the United Nations Food Systems Summit. The WTO will be an active participant in the summit to remind the world that international trade is a vital piece of the food security puzzle. I thank Agnes Kalibata and Michael Fakri for their participation in this year's symposium. We will be working with them closely to ensure that WTO's role and contribution is fully appreciated at next year's summit. Ladies and gentlemen, while it may feel like the COVID-19 pandemic divided us, in many ways, it also united us. The way in which international the international community, leaders of international organizations, and the G20 coalesced to call upon policymakers to keep food markets open and to not allow a health crisis to degenerate into a food crisis 
is evidence of how COVID brought the world together. It is clear that countries are determined not to waste this crisis and put in place mechanisms that would help the world to cope better if there were future occurrences. As mentioned multiple times over the course of this symposium, international food supply chains have resisted the pressures of the COVID-19 pandemic and markets have by and large remained open. I wish to extend a special thank you to FAO Director General Ku Dong Yu, who joined us in the opening segment of this symposium and whose support for open markets has amplified WTO's call. It is undeniable, however, that COVID-19 will usher in an era of increased governmental intervention in the economy. Governments across the globe are under pressure to assist consumers who have been impoverished by the pandemic and who need help with food purchases. They are also under pressure to assist farmers who have suffered reduced sales due to the pandemic. And we must remember that the pandemic has been playing out against a backdrop of rising trade tensions and tit for tat retaliatory measures with an impact on food and agriculture that have exacerbated the pressures of COVID. What all this means is that the WTO, the only multilateral forum with a mandate to govern international trade will even have a more important role to play in the future. Celebrating 25 years of the WTO and 25 years of the agreement on agriculture should be a moment to remind ourselves of the foresight that our forebears had. They created an institution designed to act as a stabilizing force in times of crisis. We must strengthen this stabilizing force and not weaken it. The WTO restrains members from implementing protectionist measures in times like this. It reminds countries that they have neighbors, thereby preventing destructive policies being implemented by countries. Following the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, the WTO was quick to establish an internal COVID-19 tax force that created a web portal for all new trade policy measures taken in the wake of the health crisis. That transparency and international accountability must be cherished. The global economy is more integrated today than ever before, and we must therefore think and act in unison. Ladies and gentlemen, while the COVID-19 era has turned our existence virtual, one of the objectives of this symposium was to make the WTO as personal to you as possible. Throughout each of the sessions, you have met a different number of the WTO and Agriculture's Commodities Division team, acting as the moderator from Doha, Machda, Ula, Melvin, Cedric, Fabricio, and Eric Ristrom from the Trade and Environment Division, who collaborated with us. We have sought to put faces to the names you may have heard remotely. We are here to serve you, the stakeholders of the multilateral trading system. We are not anonymous. You have now seen many members of the WTO Agricultural team, and I would urge you to call upon each and every one of us if you need any information or you want to debate any issues with us. While I am here to close the 2020 edition of this virtual symposium, I would like to immediately open the conversation on next year's edition. This conversation is not over. It is in fact just beginning. In the coming months, we will be consulting all stakeholders to see how best to organize our next um, rendezvous and how best to tailor it to your needs. Finally, I'll be remiss if I were to close without thanking the entire WTO Secretariat team that has worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this symposium possible. Whether it is the conference offices, the video services, communications and media, and the agriculture and commodities division. While three names in particular come to mind, Liliana, Helen, and Celine, I wish to thank absolutely everyone who made these two days possible. So with that, um, I would like to close the symposium. So thanks very much. Please stay in touch and stay safe. Thank you very much.